हेलो हेलो इंग्लिश हा मी चालू केले म्हटलं सगळ्यांसाठी हो 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 चालेल ऑलरेडी अराउंड हंड्रेड पार्टिसिपंट जॉईन विल वेट फॉर अ मिनिट सम मोर विल इमिजिएटली जॉईन चार्ट विंडो मध्ये ना मी युट्यूब लिंक पाठवले गुड चार्ट विंडो मध्ये पाठवली लिंक ना ओके होत आहेत बऱ्यापैकी फटाफट जॉईन होत आहेत आता ठीक आहे अजून काय क्लोज करायचं असंच ठेवू हॅलो सिद्धार्थ Siddharth, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, we are starting. The voice is clear and loud, no? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning and a warm welcome to all the panelists and uh, delegates. And also a happy Teacher's Day to all the today's teachers as well as the delegates that have joined. myself dr sunil ingre i am secretary ima pune uh, ima pune holds webinars and lectures every fortnight for its members today is a teachers day and a special occasion to learn lot many things we have been going through this covid pandemic since last two years we are the whole world is searching for the remedies and the newer symptoms of this disease we have come to a stage where we are learning the treatment part as well as we are seeing lot many sequelae of this covid today to enlighten us about the newer regimes of treatment of this covid that is the antibody cocktail uh, treatment we have noted infection specialist dr amit dravid sir dr pravin patil sir will cover about the post covid arthritis and vaccination in rheumatoid arthritis patients we are also seeing lot many avascular necrosis in the hip joint dr ashish arbat the 
hip and knee replacement surgeon will be speaking on bone death syndrome in hip joints post covid we are also seeing a lots of depression and anxiety patients due to lockdowns loss of job loss of uh, business and also loss of the dear ones so to talk about uh, post covid depression and anxiety we have noted psychiatrist dr dhananjay chavan today dr mudassir sheik from icu will be speaking about waterless bathing revolutions with this short introduction uh, i request our president elect dr minakshi deshpande madam to say a few words at the beginning minakshi madam good morning everybody all our dear ima members and non members also who are attending this webinar today i welcome you all on behalf of ima pune to this august webinar we doctors are forming a you know a essential part of the effective response as a fight to corona pandemic we continue to play our role in spite of all the risks and the imminent dangers which we face during our daily practice we diagnose the disease we advise treatment strategies as corona warriors with all frontline health personnel we keep up our commitment and our commitment is to treat to take rounds in covid infected republic knowing fully well our risks and immediate dangers to the frontline healthcare workers but as this corona virus mutates and makes its way again and again through the world in the variants and the mutations we have got new and newer modalities of treatment coming in we have got new and new strategies coming in and these strategies keep on changing with the trials the national disaster management authority has said that the third wave might peak in october however the who has said in their estimates that there will be no third wave but india is heading towards endemicity around 40% of the population in india is now vaccinated with one dose and 12 to 13% have taken the second dose but remember that the vaccination does not provide full immunity although the vaccination protects against severe disease and fatality we don't we are yet getting the patients who are fully vaccinated but still they are coming covid positive and they are going into isolation they are going into admission they are requiring admission normally they are giving <clears throat> the old routine therapies are now changing over to the new strategies herd immunity is also not feasible as even one unprotected person can allow mutations in the blood therefore covid responsible behavior is much required even now and for all the ima doctors i urge you because we are on the front forefront of all this fight i urge you to take proper precautions because as you are all knowing that we are we are having covid martyrs up over more than 1500 now and about 800 doctors have been sacrificed against this war and we feel very bad for such people and such doctors with their families who suffer so we advise you to take utmost precautions and utmost you can say protect your life your family members the cdc guidelines which have been put up on the net so please go through them and please follow those guidelines even your opds in your daily practice in your daily working in the wards there are many points which cdc has given us and we don't forget about the martyrs and the all the seniors who have really given their lives for the corona warriors all the existing legal precautions in spite of the best treatments which we give our legal protection for the doctors are inadequate although the recent amendments and the epidemic act have made attacks on the healthcare personnel and their living in their living the cognizable and non bailable offenses yet there is a need for the central legislation strong central act for protection against violence and that is what we are aiming at from ima we have been expressing our anguish and solidarity to make the government realize and ensure that we doctors should have a central hospital and healthcare professionals protection act 
with the IPC and the criminal uh, procedure code tagging. We should have an augmentation and standardization of security in each hospitals. Hospitals should be declared as a protected zone and the assault culprit should be punished under fast track mode and stringent punishment should be given. We are also asking for medical legal immunity for doctors treating such patients in spite of inadequate supplies, changing trials, changing strategies and the changing presentations of the patients in each and every wave. So we urge all our people to take utmost care as well as take care of their families and as well as be behind your MPs and your political contracts to get us a central law. We also urge the non-members to become members of IMA as soon as possible, as early as possible because our numbers are our strengths. The more we have in IMA group as such as on today in India we are having more than 33 lakh doctors but we need more. And we urge you all to each one reach one and bring more members into our IMA group. We also donate, also urge you to donate for the medical legal fund and the COVID multiers fund, which we are always advertising in our IMA plus and our daily mails. So please be a active IMA member and each one of you bring one. Thank you all. And I wish to start this webinar with a shlok on account of Teacher's Day. I hope my secretary say it with me. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venama. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Now I request my co-secretary, Dr. Alka Shirsagar, Madam, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Amit Dravi. Good morning and warm welcome. Uh, very nice weather in Pune today, Reni. So uh, I'll be introducing Dr. Amit Dravid. Uh, he'll be speaking on role of Kasseri map and MDV map in the management of COVID-19 patients. Uh, he's a consultant in HIV medicine and infectious diseases Ruby Hall Clinic and Pune Hospital, Pune. He's got two academic publications and uh, to say uh, discordant CSF and plasma HIV-1 RNA in individuals on uh, virologically suppressive anti-retroviral uh, therapy in Western India. That is one. And the other one is uh, incidence of tuberculosis among HIV-infected individuals on long-term anti-retroviral therapy in private healthcare sector in Pune, Western India. He's got uh, many scholarships and uh, his achievements are scholarships to attend advanced course in HIV medicine, which was held at Montpellier, France, uh, uh, awarded scholarship to attend the research course in HIV medicine, which was held at Zagreb, Croatia, junior researcher award, 11th International Congress on Drug Therapy in HIV Infection held at Glasgow, UK and ESCS scholarship to attend 15th European AIDS conference held at Barcelona, Spain. He is a member of American Academy of HIV Medicine, member of AIDS Society of India, member of International AIDS Society of uh, India Society, and member European AIDS Clinical Society. So over to Dr. Amit Dravid. Good morning, welcome, sir. Am I audible, madam? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. I am sharing my screen now. Yes. Is the screen visible? Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, I am a Pune, and wish you all a happy Teachers' Day, and thank you for inviting me for this lecture, and. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of Cassivirimab and Imdevimab, the new Cipla monoclonal cocktail, which is now available for management of COVID-19 in Pune and in India all over. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll give you a sneak peek into where as general practitioners, you can place this Cipla cocktail and how you can use it for the benefit of your patients who come into your OPDs and who get admitted in your hospitals. So to start off, this is the virus which we are tackling with and we have been tackling from last uh, 18 months 
as i have always said we don't need weapons of mass destruction for killing people a 120 nanometer virus can do the same job as a bofors missile so we should now understand what our priorities are and healthcare should always be our priority at the top of our mind this is the covid virus and this is the spike protein which is responsible for all the pathogenicity so these are the spikes which are all over the virus because of which it gets a crown shape and it is known as coronavirus and this is the spike protein which goes and attaches to the ac2 receptor on the nose or in the lung epithelial cells because of which the virus enters the body and then starts creating the problems which it does we have just been uh, just to give the statistics to start off in the first 5 minutes we have just finished the second wave in march april 2021 and you can see the for second wave which was called caused by the delta variant was four times more uh, infectious than the first wave where there were 1 lakh cases per day at the peak while in the second wave there were 4 lakh cases at the peak so we have come down from there but the worrying thing you can see here is the cases are spiking again so in the last two or three days all of you must have seen more number of cases coming positive in your opds and suddenly from 30000 we have now reached 45000 cases a day all over india with kerala contributing to 70% of the cases and maharashtra not long behind with second highest number of covid cases in india so you can see there is a small spike i hope this spike doesn't go up and doesn't cause issues to us in the near future and that's why government of india is now telling us that maybe in october we will have the third wave because we are already seeing a gradual spike you can see the active cases which had gone down have again leveled off and again started picking up so the covid positivity rate has also started going up in the last 3 or 4 days even sasun hospital which is the apex testing center in pune i have friends over there who are now reporting higher covid positivity in the last week or so what about mortality we all know the delta variant just hammered india like anything the mortality was four times that of the first wave so if in the first wave the mortality was around 1000 deaths a day in the first wave it went up to 4000 deaths a day uh, in the second wave we have now come down so the delta variant was definitely more infectious more transmissible more deadly with more number of patients requiring oxygen non invasive ventilation ards and finally dying because of the delta variant so we hope that a new variant doesn't rise up and we don't we hope that a, we don't have to tackle another deadlier variant in the third wave the only problem signs as i said there are few states who have now started showing increased cases and the bigger problem now in india are two states one is kerala one is mizoram where the cases are rising so remember that you know maharashtra the second wave started and then it spread to all of india i hope the third wave doesn't start in kerala or in mizoram and doesn't spread to all over india so there are problem states kerala and mizoram are one of the problem states maharashtra is also reporting uh, at least 7 to 8000 cases per day which is not a good sign the mortality is well under control although kerala is reporting 70% of the cases you can see the mortality is only 0.5% while all over india the mortality is around 1.5% to 2% so only punjab and maharashtra have so a slightly higher mortality than india so in maharashtra also the mortality is around 2% so remember we have to bring it down further and hopefully with my lecture on monoclonal antibody we will be convinced to use it more often and decrease the mortality even further problem about vaccination india has sped up its vaccination but only around 52% of india has received the first dose eligible patients you can see certain states are doing phenomenally well uttarakhand kerala and himachal pradesh have almost given 80% of the population its first jab while maharashtra is lagging behind only 45% of the people have received their first jab so you can see maharashtra has a long way to go we need to jab many more people only 45% of the eligible people have received the first dose while all india 52% of the people have received the first dose so why i say a third wave is coming is because in maharashtra almost 55% of the people are still unvaccinated and hence at risk of infection by a new variant what about full vaccination india has reached 
and Maharashtra is around 17%. But look at other states, Kerala, Delhi, and Himachal, where almost 30% of the people have received both doses. So we have a long way to go. We have to catch up the people, the states who are running higher. And only once we receive reach 70 to 80% of double doses, can we open up Maharashtra to everyone and we can have mass gatherings and mass uh, even IMA gatherings in person we can have only if we reach this dose. So we have a long way to go until then I hope a new variant does not arise and we don't have to face a third wave. Whatever I have learned about COVID-19 is because of the work done by my team at Noble Hospital and Research Center. We have now been able to admit almost 5,500 patients in the last 18 months. And whatever I have learned about COVID-19 is what my team has done for the patients and what we have learned from them. And I remain entirely indebted to the entire healthcare fraternity in India and in Noble Hospital as my team for teaching me a lot of things about COVID-19. So now we move to the main topic about uh, monoclonal antibody cocktail. This is a simple graph of the life history of the virus. You can see the virus has a spike protein which attaches to the AC2 receptor. It enters into the cell. It uncoats itself. The RNA, single strand RNA comes out. It then undergoes multiplication by RNA dependent RNA polyparase, makes baby RNAs, baby viruses, and then gets out of the cell by destroying the cell. Whatever drugs we knew up till now are mentioned over here. So your Remdesivir or Favipravir are RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors which prevent production of new RNA and production of new viruses. While chloroquine and all these things prevent membrane fusion and entry of the virus into the cell. While the tocilizumab which we use for cytokine storm is the IL-6 blocker which occurs because of the inflammatory storm triggered by the virus. Where does this SARS-CoV-2 uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal cocktail target, it targets the spike protein. So it does not target the cellular aspect, it targets the spike protein aspect of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it goes and binds to this spike protein and prevents this spike protein from attaching to the AC2 receptor and entering into the cell. So this is the first antiviral which goes and directly blocks the virus because of which the virus cannot enter into the cell uh, and then uh, the pathogenic process does not stop, does not start. So you can see, I have always made it clear that there are two phases of the virus. The first seven to 10 days is the viral phase. And the next seven to 10 days is the host inflammatory phase. What happens in the viral phase? That is when the virus enters your body, attaches to the cell, starts causing flu-like symptoms like fever, cough, cold. And that is when you go and consult the doctor. The you, immunity of the person has not woken up till now. So this is the first 7 to 10 days when the virus is playing havoc in the body. You feel very sick, fever, myalgia. You feel like sleeping. You go to the uh, doctor. You get tested. The COVID RT-PCR comes positive. So any antiviral you want to give is the best suited in the first 7 to 10 days. So this is where the viral load is at the highest. And now it has been made very clear that higher the viral load in your nostril, higher the risk of progression to severe disease. So whenever there is high viral load, you will get symptoms. And that is when antivirals like Remdesivir, and now I'm going to talk about Cipla cocktail or monoclonal antibody cocktail, that will work best in the first seven to 10 days. Once the host inflammatory response wakes up, Majority of the time, the host inflammatory response destroys the virus and you have a mild or asymptomatic course and you recover. So 80% of the patients, the host inflammatory response will just destroy the virus and you will recover without any problem. But if you are old, if you have comorbidities, if your immunity is dysfunctional, this inflammatory response will become exaggerated and then you will uh, go into hyperinflammation phase or the cytokine storm phase where you will go into ARDS and land up on a ventilator. So wherever the host inflammatory response is dysfunctional or exaggerated, we have to use anti-inflammatory drugs. That is tocilizumab, that is dexamethasone. So these drugs work here. So there is a definite phase when a drug can work. Anti-inflammatory drugs work after around seven to 10 days. Antiviral drugs work best in the first seven to 10 days. So 
the best positioning of the antiviral is during the viral response phase. Remember that many people ask me, patient is admitted on day one, he has no signs of host inflammatory response, should I give steroids? Remember, there is a clear cut definition as to when to use anti-inflammatory and when to use antivirals. Now coming to our monoclonal antibody cocktail. What are these? Cassivirimab and Indevimab are both IgG1 monoclonal antibodies which target a separate epitope on the spike protein. Remember, spike protein is the one which has the pathogenic feature of the SARS-CoV-2. What does this antibody cocktail? These are two different antibodies working on two different sites of the spike protein. They just go and bind that antibody, uh, the spike protein non-competitively and prevent that spike protein from targeting the AC2 receptor. So you can see here, this are the, these are the antibodies. They just go and block the spike protein. You can see here, the spike protein has nowhere to go. The virus has nowhere to go. And once they block it, they, they activate the antibody response. They activate the T cells. So the T cells will come and scavenge this virus and kill the virus. Or the antibodies will come and release their uh, high, uh, oxygen intermediates because of which there will be oxidative storm and the virus will get killed. So this is the specific and simple mechanism of the infusion of Cassivirimab and Imdevimab. Remember, we used to use convalescent plasma around six to nine months back for COVID-19. And people, some people say it works, some people say it doesn't work. After the recovery trial, it was clear that using Convalescent plasma is not useful, but the principle of convalescent plasma was correct and Regineuron picked up this uh, uh, concept and identified certain highly neutralizing antibodies from plasma of recovered patients. They found out these two antibodies, which have the highest attachment to the spike protein, they purified them, uh, cultured them in ch Chinese hamsters and then prepared this, uh, this cocktail. So remember, the uh, convalescent plasma which we were using, the concept was not incorrect. The concept was correct, but that plasma contained a lot of other polyclonal antibodies as well, which was actually reducing the function of the actual neutralizing antibodies. By purifying these neutralizing antibodies from plasma of recovered patients, we now have a highly lethal cocktail, which can then kill the virus with, with uh, much, much ease. So the concept has come from there. Convalescent plasma, which was very much maligned last six months, has actually contributed to this monoclonal cocktail, which we are seeing now in India. So the question arises, where do we use it? So is there any role in patients of non-hospitalized mild COVID patients? Remember, the first seven to 10 days is the viral phase. That is when the patient has mild disease, but has a lot of URTI symptoms. So Instinctively, we must say that the best chance of working is in the first seven to 10 days. That is when the Cipla cocktail or the monoclonal cocktail or the Regineuron cocktail will work. So this paper was published in NEGM and what it said was very clear that if your person who is coming to you is RT-PCR positive and his antibody status is negative and is coming to you with mild disease within 72 hours of onset of symptoms, once you give them this Regineuron cocktail or Cipla cocktail, the viral load reduction is much, much faster if you give this cocktail. So remember, I have always said that initially we thought high nasopharyngeal viral load actually carries no meaning. But over time, it is now clear that high nasopharyngeal viral load means large amount of virus to cause pathogenicity, larger amount of virus into the lung and higher chance of progression to ARDS and death. So now, Everybody is targeting the nasopharyngeal viral load and with if you are serum antibody negative, RT-PCR positive, this Cipla cocktail will lead to much, much faster reduction in your nasopharyngeal viral load. And when they looked at how many patients landed up in the hospital, these patients were given RT-PCR, they were RT-PCR positive, antibody negative, mild disease, given this cocktail on OPD basis. And when they looked at how many patients landed up in the hospital or required ventilator or required ICU, they found that once you give this cocktail, there is a reduction from 15% to 6% of people who required admission, hospital admission or required ICU. So there was almost a 70% reduction in patients who were serum antibody negative RT-PCR positive. When they looked at antibody positive and RT-PCR positive patients, there was not much difference. So initially it was concluded that in those people where the endogenous immune response has not started and who are RT-PCR positive, in those patients, 
there is the highest chance of this cocktail antibody working and it will reduce the nasopharyngeal viral load and it will reduce medically attended visits into the hospital by almost 70%. So all these people who have comorbidities who are at high risk of progression of severe disease, if we end up giving them this cocktail, we can reduce their progression to the hospital or uh, admission into a hospital by 70%. And you can see it can free up so many hospital beds for really treating those patients who are clinically sick. So the first study, which was carried out in only 70 patients, said very clearly that if you have the virus and you don't have any antibodies, that means you don't have any endogenous immune response, the cocktail will work magically well, especially if you have comorbidities, especially if you have high risk of disease, giving this cocktail will prevent your progression to severe disease and 70% reduction in hospitalization and medically attended visits. So after this study came out, uh, the US FDA and the European uh, EUA gave it a emergency use authorization for use in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. And also the US FDA said, wherever there are variants of concern, like the alpha variant or the beta variant, you can use this monoclonal cocktail for treating such patients. So then US FDA came out with a list of comorbidities where you can use this if the patient has mild to moderate disease. That means the patient has say a CT score less than eight or nine has come to you in the OPD, has upper respiratory tract symptoms, is not on oxygen, saturation is good, but you feel he's at high risk of progression to severe disease, like he's obese, his body mass index is more than 35, or he has chronic kidney disease, or he has diabetes, or he has immunosuppressive disease, or if he has just age more than 65 years, or he has past history of cardiovascular disease, like angiography or angioplasty being done, or he's, he has hypertension, or he has a chronic smoker and has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all these patients, if they have mild disease today, have a high risk of progression to severe disease tomorrow. So if they come to you within the first seven days or within say 72 hours of onset of symptoms, identify them if they are RT-PCR positive, antibody negative, give them this cocktail and 70% of them will be saved and they will not progress to severe disease while the others, if you don't give this cocktail, might progress to severe disease. What about children? They also made a, 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 a guideline for children. That means if your child is more than 12 years of age, but he is obese, that means his BMI is more than 85th percentile, or if he has sickle cell disease, or if he has congenital heart disease, or he has neurodevelopmental disorder like cerebral palsy, or he has others uh, like, like reactive airway disease, asthma, even such children or more than 12 years of age, if they have mild disease today, can progress to severe disease. And we have seen children with cerebral palsy, seen children with thalassemia coming in with severe COVID disease. There also, you, if you identify it early and give this cocktail, you can prevent progression to severe disease. So remember, initially it started off as a therapy for mild disease, especially used in OPD for patients who are RT-PCR positive and antibody negative. So now, as of now in India, it is used in elderly individuals young individuals with high risk of progression with uncontrolled comorbidities, like someone with uh, HbA1c of 12 or someone with BP of more than 160, 90 continuously. So the patient should come in the first seven days of symptoms. We can uh, increase it to 10 days. The patient does not require oxygen currently. He is COVID antibody negative, RT-PCR positive, and he can afford it. So you can see the cost of this CIPLA cocktail goes to around 60,000 per patient. If you count remdesivir, it will come down to around 30,000. So it is at least double the uh, cost of remdesivir, but given it will have a, a much, much benefit in preventing hospitalization and preventing death as well. So how do we give it? We give it in a 50 ml, 0.9% saline and infuse it over 20 minutes. 5 ml of casivirimab and 5 ml of imdevimab is added to 0.9% NS and given over 20 minutes. So it's a one hour as you give uh, you know injectable uh, iron supplements in your opds it is as simple as that giving it in the opd where as i've already made it clear pediatric use is allowed if your child is more than 12 years of age and above 40 kg it can be given even in pregnant and lactating women remember that delta variant has been especially very hard on pregnant women so if your patient is a pregnant lady in the sixth month she is having mild covid disease plus she has preeclampsia or her BP is high or she has some other comorbidity where you suspect that she might progress to severe disease, there is no contraindication in giving this cocktail for pregnant or lactating women as well. 
Similarly, in renal impairment, there is no dosage ad adjustment. If a patient of CKD comes to you at create of six with mild COVID disease and is willing for the cocktail, you can give him if he is RT-PCR positive and antibody negative. If hepatic impairment, you can uh, evaluate and if the person does not have severe hepatic impairment, you can end up giving this cocktail. So remember, there are multiple indications in which we can use it. So the precautions which are written were initially, these are old precautions. They made it clear that initially, if you are going to use it for hospitalized patients, sorry, non-hospitalized patients with mild disease, your patient should not be hospitalized, should not require oxygen and should not be breathless. If you are going to use, uh, there is hardly any use of this cocktail for patients who are in the ICU or you know, hospitalized and require oxygen. So initially it said that these precautions have to be followed. Whether these precautions have to be followed now, I will let you know in my future slides. So initially it was clear, mild disease, non-hospitalized, RT-PCR positive, antibody negative, use this cocktail. Then they delved into it further. They included more and more patients and they realized, and then they published the further phase three studies of patients. And this was the study where they looked at again, mild to moderate COVID-19 outpatients with mild disease or moderate disease. But this time they included antibody positive patients as well. So initially they thought, okay, only RT-PCR positive, antibody negative, only those patients should be included. But this was a large study, which included thousands of patients where they were all mild to moderate disease, all had come to within three days of onset of symptoms. You can see here. And they also looked at multiple doses. Initially, they looked at 1200 milligram, 2400 milligram, 8 gram, everywhere they looked at. And they gave them this, this CIPLA cocktail. You can see 1200, 1200, 700, 700, large number of pool with a very high viral load. You can see the viral load here very high viral load. So mild disease, high nasopharyngeal viral load, but this time they included both RT-PCR positive and RT-PCR negative, both patients and gave them this cocktail. And they found that irrespective of whether you are RT uh, antibody positive or antibody negative, this was working. And it was giving a risk reduction of almost 70% of COVID related hospitalization and death at day 29. So any person who was RT-PCR positive today coming with mild disease and whether it was antibody positive or antibody negative, it didn't matter. They just gave him this cocktail. If he had the risk factors, which I have mentioned in my previous slides, they found out that giving it for mild to moderate disease, there was a 70% reduction in hospitalization and death as well. So this was having mortality benefit if used in time. That means used within first seven days of onset of symptoms plus the resolution of symptoms was four days earlier. So any patient was actually becoming fit and fine four days early and this was also statistically significant. Though the symptoms were uh, uh, resolved earlier, patients were not requiring hospitalization. There was 70% reduction in hospitalization and because they were not getting hospitalized, they were not going on to a ventilator and they were not dying. That was also a 70% reduction. So you can see they looked at all the doses and the 1200 milligram dose, which we are using currently was also tested and was found equivalent to the 2400 milligram dose, which is used in America. So the dose was good. Reduction was good. It has to be used in the first seven to 10 days, whether it was RT-PCR positive and antibody negative or positive. Now it did not make much of a difference. I must say this is a made RXIV preprint, but the study is very, very well conducted. So you can see the viral load reduction is what is actually driving uh, the reduction in death and reduction in hospitalization, whether you are antibody positive or negative in mild disease is not making much of a difference. So you can see the efficacy is clear for all of you to see if you are giving placebo and if you are giving Regineuron cocktail, the hospitalization and death is coming down by almost 70% and your symptoms are resolving four days early. So salient features of this is that if you have mild to moderate disease, and if your person is RT-PCR positive and has more than one risk factor for progression to severe disease, definitely, and he's affording, he can take 60,000 worth of injection, definitely give him this cocktail. Whether he's RT-PCR antibody positive or negative doesn't make much of a difference. He will not land up in the hospital. He will not die. That at risk will come down by 70% and he will get early, almost four days earlier. So now it is clear that 
the nasopharyngeal viral load is more important your endogenous immune response is not that important because now it is clear that although you are antibody positive say you have taken vaccination and you are antibody positive many people have dysfunctional immune response so those antibodies actually don't count for much and still people land up in severe covid 19 so you can you have, madam earlier said that we are now getting patients who are double vaccinated and still landing up in the icu still landing up in the hospital that is because although they are antibody positive that immune response is dysfunctional so if they have symptoms and if they have high risk of progression please consider this therapy for treatment then they looked at whether they, uh, the this cocktail works against all variants and the result was clear that whether it is the uk variant the south african variant the california variant the brazil variant the indian variant or the delta variant there is no change in reduction and there is no change for, uh, in, there is no change in fold reduction in susceptibility why because you are uh, using two antibodies which are uh, non overlapping it's a combination of antibodies so one antibody although the resistance might develop to one antibody it is very very difficult for resistance to develop to a cocktail or two antibodies so that's why this cocktail was made and it was used together because the virus is mutating so fast scientists thought that if you use just one antibody resistance might develop and the product might go fail in fact eli lilly also came back came uh, came uh, came out with one antibody which was bamlevinumab and that failed because it was just one antibody it was not combined with the cocktail and now even eli lilly is coming out with a, another cocktail of two antibodies because they also realized that these variants will uh, destroy if we use uh, destroy uh, the product if we use only one antibody a cocktail of antibodies is needed to keep these variants under control and to destroy these variants so that is why this cocktail has come and it is now working it is clear that it works against all variants what about safety profile the largest recovery trial which i'll come back to in my next slide there were only five infusion related reactions in around 3000 patients so you can see it is very safe it can cause an infusion reaction so if your patient has history of allergy that doesn't mean you deny uh, this cocktail to that patient but you can look out for fever chills nausea bronchospasm hypotension angioedema throat irritation rash all this can occur but the incidence is less than 1% so it's a very purified and good product hypersensitivity reaction anaphylaxis is very very rare less than 1% in about 3000 patients which have been tested up till now so now it is clear that for non hospitalized patients this antibody cocktail is good whether you are antibody negative or positive it doesn't matter if you have mild disease coming within 7 days given this cocktail and if you have high risk of progression your chance of uh, landing up in the hospital and dying reduces by 70% so then they went one step further and said then what about hospitalized patient because we are getting patients who come breathless to us directly those who are on oxygen those who are on hfno those who are on invasive mechanical ventilation whether we can use it for them so this was the recovery trial remember recovery trial was the first to show that dexamethasone works recovery trial was the first to show that tocilizumab has a mortality benefit and it actually told us that tocilizumab should be used for patients of cytokine storm these are the two drugs which recovery trial has recommended for use as an anti inflammatory in covid 19 and now it has come out with this recovery uh, uh, co uh, regeneron cocktail data and you can see here they included almost 1600 patients and total of 4800 patients received this regeneron cocktail while 4000 patients received placebo so almost 9000 patients are now in this study and you can see you can see these patients here they are all rt pcr positive some of them are antibody positive some of them are antibody negative and they have received oxygen so you can see there were 66% on simple oxygen 20% on niv 2% on invasive mechanical ventilation so even severe patients were included to look at so they included rt pcr positive antibody positive or negative patients who were hospitalized they were on oxygen hfno or invasive mechanical ventilation and they found that if your patient is rt pcr positive antibody negative and in the icu given this cocktail actually reduces mortality also so this cocktail also works beyond 10 days of the disease during the and during the inflammatory phase as well and if you give it to people who are rt pcr positive and antibody negative remember it did not work in antibody positive 
so for non hospitalized patients this cocktail worked in antibody positive and negative as well but for hospitalized patients who required oxygen niv this cocktail worked only in patients who were antibody negative and there the mortality reduction was from 30% to 24% a 6% reduction over and above the other therapies which were used remember these patients 90% received steroids around 25% also received tocilizumab so this cocktail works as an antiviral even in patients who are rt pcr positive antibody negative and admitted in the hospital require oxygen niv or imv not just that if your patient is admitted and receives this cocktail the hospitalization also reduced by 4 days so your bed strength uh, your more beds were released more patients were released home faster so that your beds could be given to other patients similarly if your patient is on oxygen today his progression to niv or invasive mechanical ventilation also reduced his uh, progression to niv reduced his progression to invasive mechanical ventilation reduced his progression to death also reduced so not just in non hospitalized patients even in hospitalized patients who are rt pcr positive and antibody negative this therapy worked it is clear this is where it worked most the zero negative people were the ones who were most benefited so in conclusion now it is clear that this cocktail of casivirimab and imdivimab which binds non competitively to the spike protein is indicated in mild to moderate patients irrespective of their antibody status for prevention of developing severe disease that reduction is almost 70% of hospitalization and death in hospitalized patients also that is those who are on oxygen and niv uh, this can be used if you are rt pcr positive but antibody negative antibody positive hospitalized it doesn't work it is well tolerated it has no safety signal and a single iv injection can be given in out patients and in in patients as well and i would recommend it to all the uh, general practitioners who are seeing patients in the opd uh, with mild disease and giving them if they have risk factors for progression to severe disease to prevent their hospitalization and reduce their death by almost 70% thank you and i'll take whatever questions come my way yes sir thank you very much for your very elaborative lecture on monoclonal antibodies and uh, the three there are three questions sir uh, uh, does that mean starting antibody cocktail therapy on first few days only is effective after that no use no madam i have already made it clear that if yes, you have mild are, disease in the first 7 to 10 days use it but if you get a patient who is directly admitted in your hospital who has come on day 12 day 13 but is rt pcr positive and antibody negative and he has a high risk of progression to severe disease and is willing to afford this cocktail around 60000 rupees then giving it to him also has a mortality benefit so it can be used in the first 10 days or the next 10 days uh, in the first 10 days irrespective of your antibody status in the next 10 days if you are on oxygen niv or invasive mechanical ventilation only for antibody negative rt pcr positive giving cocktail helps okay thank you sir now another question is if patient has taken vaccine and has antibodies against spike protein should cocktail therapy be given it depends whether the patient is mild disease or severe disease if the patient is mild disease it works even in patients who have antibody positive so the antibody positive can be because of the vaccine but clearly if the patient has developed the disease that means those antibodies are dysfunctional if they were they were dysfunctional that's why he developed the disease so giving it in those patients mild moderate patients who have taken vaccine no problem but if he is severe disease and he is antibody positive because of the vaccine there we avoid it we only give it for antibody negative so you will be surprised many of our patients who are coming into our icus say that they have received vaccines one or two and then they are on ventilator they are on niv and when we do their antibodies the antibodies are zero mm. so it's quite likely that some of our patients not everyone who have received double vaccination but have not triggered that immune response because they were immunodeficient or their immunity was not proper or dysregulated so in such patients giving this cocktail and remember this cocktail remains in your body for 90 days its half life is 28 days so it will not just give you protection it will destroy the virus but it will also give it protection for reinfection which might occur in the next 90 days and that's why the government says that if you have got this cocktail 
take your vaccination after 90 days because for the first 90 days these antibodies will remain in your body and they will not help the vaccine trigger the immune response and that's why it really works yes sir sir uh, the last and most important question where it is available madam it is marketed it is from by the doctor taka takavle dhananjay yeah this this cocktail is manufactured by regineuron and uh, uh, marketed by sipla so any sipla medical representative will have the number of the uh, dealer who actually uh, distributes this so you can get in touch with any sipla medical representative okay. and tell them to get the number of sipla cocktail and they will get it uh, it is only hospital supply so they can get it to your clinic as well uh, to give it to the patient so just contact a sipla medical representative and they will give it to you i am having one question dr amit dravid for you yes ma'am it was a very excellent lecture very much explanatory and uh, uh, informative also for all delegates and as well as for us thank you would you advise doing a uh, antibody testing after two vaccinations are over for yeah. some uh, some uh, comorbid patients or for comorbid people uh, no madam because uh, for two reasons number one uh, uh, as i said the antibodies will wane over time so if you have taken okay. your uh, vaccine say in uh, february and march hmm. then over in the next 6 months if the patient is not exposed to the covid virus these antibodies will wane and become zero but that doesn't mean that he has no antibodies once again if he is exposed to those antigens or exposed to the virus his antibodies will rise again so saying that i had taken a vaccine 6 months back and my antibody is zero doesn't mean that you have no immunity Secondly, okay. we don't have any measure of T cell immunity. Remember, oh. antibodies only measure B cell immunity. These vaccines will trigger both B cell and T cell immunity. And although if you have no B cells, the T cell will always be there. So doing it randomly for all patients is not needed. But those patients who get to your hospital with symptoms or those patients who get admitted in your hospital with symptoms, mm. in then an antibody titer should be done because in those patients, the antibodies are deficient and the patient has developed a disease symptoms. but other patients who have just taken a vaccine and are asymptomatic doing them to just check the efficacy of the vaccine is not mandatory because the efficacy is not determined on your antibody status the efficacy is determined on how it protects you from disease okay there are a few more questions for you yes madam uh, sir uh, should remdesivir be continued or no what inflammatory markers we should monitor after giving cocktail therapy so uh, as a policy in mobile hospital if the patient has received uh, this cocktail we don't give remdesivir because they are both antivirals they are doing the both the same job so then taxing the patient giving 60000 worth of cocktail and 30000 worth of remdesivir just jacks up the cost and ultimately the studies are clear that the cocktail will work irrespective of remdesivir so if you are giving the cocktail you don't need to give remdesivir if the person is not willing for cocktail then you can give remdesivir you can give one of the two you don't need to give a combination of both for the patient's viral load to come down one cocktail is enough uh, the so second what, question, huh, second what question, inflammatory markers we should monitor after giving cocktail therapy uh, we don't monitor any inflammatory markers we monitor the symptoms so if the patient's symptoms like fever cough cold myalgia reduce we don't do anything if the person is admitted is hospitalized is on oxygen or on niv there, if your patient is not affording, you can just monitor his CRP. If the CRP is very high, say around 75, 80 today, and has come down to 10 or 12, that means the inflammation is settling. But I always look at the symptoms and the clinical picture. If the patient is clinically improving, then we don't need to do any inflammatory markers. If the patient is deteriorating, then we do the inflammatory markers for the patient. Okay. There's one more question in the chat box. Yeah. How long it will be protective if we give cocktail just not the, yet, about 90 days uh, yeah i already period. mentioned and yeah. the treatment will start working in three days so whatever benefit you will see in one to three days you will see so the i always tell the patient for the first one or two days the symptoms might remain but after two days the symptoms start reducing and after three days there is definite reduction in symptoms and the patient improves faster Is there any harm? Sir, is there any harm in giving both Remdesivir and uh, Regeneron? No harm. No harm. The only thing is the cost. 
i always think about the cost and plus it is clear that adding will not give much benefit so you are just giving two drugs and the benefit is unknown so okay thank you very much sir my pleasure uh, now i will request our uh, president elect dr minakshi deshpande to felicitate you Uh, this is for you, Dr. Amit Ravid, for giving an excellent talk. Okay. Our uh, <laughs> knowledge of uh, the new co cocktail therapy. Thank you. Thank, sir, thank you, sir. Thank you very sir, much. This, this is I am a upper nurse. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Our second. Uh, talk is on post covid arthritis and vaccination in ra patients we have a rheumatologist dr pravin patil sir uh, to talk about it dr pravin patil has done his mbbs from nair hospital mumbai he has done mrcp from royal college of physicians uk and cct rheumatology from london Dr. Patil has gained vast experience during 10 years of practice in UK. Dr. Patil is currently working in Pune, attached to Birla Hospital, Dinath Mangeshkar Hospital and Sayadri Hospital. With this short introduction, over to you, Patil, sir. Dr. Praveen Patil, sir. Hi. I hope you can see me and hear me. Yes, sir. Hi. So thank you, IMA. Thanks once again for inviting me. Um, I think before uh, all this lockdown business started, we have been conducting regular CMEs for IMA. But in uh, last one or one and a half year, things have changed a lot. But thanks once again and very interesting uh, uh, the topics you have chosen. And then a, a, a great lecture by Dr. Amit Dravid. Um, and uh, let's see if I can follow his footsteps and give you somewhat similar picture from a rheumatology point of view. Um, can you can you see my slides? Are they visible? Are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we'll try to keep it a bit more simple and uh, interactive. Feel free to put down your questions there. Uh, so I'm going to talk about post-COVID arthritis and vaccination in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Uh, so there are quite a few questions from a patient side when they will come to their doctor, whether they can take the vaccination or not, because they are on certain medications or they, are, they have certain autoimmune diseases. So let's, let's start with post-COVID arthritis. Um, so this is the progress which we have made in last uh, last uh, 100 years or so that we have moved from the bullock cart to the car and then from this phone to this phone and then this type of aeroplane to the fancy aeroplanes but do you know what one thing that has not changed the lectures the lectures were boring centuries ago and they can be boring even now so we will try to uh, remain brief and try to keep it very simple for you, so that uh, uh, so so that you you don't you don't face that boredom which has been faced by the audience centuries for the last centuries. So let's talk about the post-viral arthritis. So post-viral arthritis can can range from simple arthralgia to the persistent chronic inflammatory phase, just like rheumatoid arthritis. So it could range anywhere. The post-viral chronic arthritis, which is very commonly seen in uh, in India, is with the uh, chikungunya virus arthritis. So that's we are all familiar with. Uh, there is another type where it is self-limited acute polyarthritis, which is a transient, does not last more than a month or so, usually seen with parvovirus or so. And then arthralgia and myalgia. So coming back to COVID with coronaviruses in general, not just COVID-19, COVID but with the human coronaviruses in general, they are more known to cause arthralgia and myalgia rather than the chronic arthritis as we see in chikungunya type of arthritis. 
uh, even between the arthralgia and myalgia arthralgia is much less around 10 to 15 percent however myalgia is very common almost up to 50 percent patients uh, with uh, covid 19 illness they will report myalgia is uh, one of the important presenting symptoms now there is an interesting question going on in the literature can covid 19 pandemic lead to increased incidence of rheumatoid arthritis the reason behind this, there is a Korean study where they found that when the um, virus moves from pandemic to endemic stage, so particularly the human coronavirus or the para-influenza viruses, when they go from the pandemic to endemic stage, there has been uh, reports of increased development of rheumatoid arthritis. So far, there is no such indication and the let's watch the space over the next few years. So this is, I would like to urge all of you to uh, be, care, be, um, be uh, cautious when you're assisting patients with post-COVID status. So why there is low prevalence of, COVID, uh, prevalence of arthritis in COVID? Any particular reason? You can put in the chat box if you can think of. I can. So the literature does not have any specific answer why there is less of arthritis in COVID compared to say chikungunya virus illness. So possible explanation one could be the drugs we are using. So we are using hydroxychloroquine or the steroids quite early on, and that may prevent the development of inflammatory manifestation, particularly in the musculoskeletal system. That is one of the possibilities. So let's understand two terminology. When we say post-viral polyarthritis versus post-viral polyarthralgia. So these are two different things. Whenever you are assessing a patient who has, who has, who is in post-COVID status and they have musculoskeletal symptoms. So if they have joint pain and swelling, then clearly you are dealing with polyarthritis. If they are only joint pains and no swelling, then you are dealing with polyarthralgia. So the treatment can be a little different if your patient has polyarthralgia or polyarthritis. So as I said, with polyarthralgia, you don't expect to see much of joint swelling. It's more of a pain. And with polyarthritis, there will be swelling in the joints or tendons. They may have tenosynovitis. Morning stiffness is important feature with polyarthritis. They, they, you expect patients report around 30 to 45 minutes of stiffness in the morning or with inactivities. These symptoms are less prominent in patients with arthralgia. And of course, with polyarthritis, there is a high load of inflammation. So you expect to see high ESR CRP. And with arthralgia, you expect to see normal ESR CRP. These, these, are, the, these are the possible indicators when you are assessing patients with uh, musculoskeletal symptoms. So post-COVID arthritis is a form of a reactive arthritis. This is what it has been believed. So remember, this is very new entity and it is not that common. So there is still a lot of research is going on on post-COVID arthritis, but it is considered it could be a form of reactive arthritis and it fulfills this major and minor criteria. So what's the treatment? So what's the treatment of post-COVID arthritis? Uh, so post-COVID arthritis, you first need to remember that patients should have symptoms for more than six weeks, then that is the time to think about treating those symptoms. Most of the symptoms within six weeks will resolve on its own. So it will have self-limiting course and, uh, and the symptomatic treatment should be good enough. If patient has symptoms more than six weeks, then you must uh, think about involving a rheumatologist because there could be an underlying autoimmune disease like say rheumatoid arthritis or connective tissue disease. It could have been there earlier and unmasked by the viral infection or triggered by the viral infection. NSAIDs or short-term steroids is the in initial line of treatment. And in some patients, we end up giving the disease-modifying uh, drugs, just like in rheumatoid arthritis, we use hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, or methotrexate. So in my experience, post-COVID musculoskeletal symptoms, things which I have come across, <coughs> excuse me, in last few months. So avian, avian uh, avascular necrosis of hip joints I have come across. It could be related steroids or it may not be related steroids. At least I have one or two patients where they have, they are very sure that they have not received steroids at all. And we see AVN where there is no uh, patient has never received steroids at all. They do not have conventional risk factors like say smoking or alcohol and they still develop AVN. So AVN is an evolving entity. It is little, um, 
well understood in the medical literature and uh, still needs a lot of research, but it is seen in COVID infection in association with COVID infection and may or may not be related to steroids. Polyarthritis, we discussed about this. Rheumatoid arthritis, this is interesting. I came across a patient's whole, whole family was affected with COVID and two members, family members develop seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. So not just one, two of them develop seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. And this is uh, clearly following the uh, COVID-19 illness. So RT-PCR positive type of illness. Dermatomyositis, I have seen one patient uh, develop dermatomyositis following the uh, COVID-19 uh, illness. And then Lofgren syndrome. You Are you aware of Lofgren syndrome? So Lofgren syndrome is a basically acute presentation of sarcoidosis where patients following usually upper respiratory tract illness develop erythema nodosum on the lower limbs and then ankle synovitis, bilateral ankle synovitis. And if you do a chest x-ray or CT scan, it will show hilar lymphadenopathy. So this type of picture is a triad of ankle synovitis. Um, erythema nodosum and hilar lymphadenopathy. So this I have come across as well in patients uh, with post-COVID status. So I will quickly, before we move on to the next topic, which is about the vaccination in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, I will quickly share with you a case that just like all that glitters is not gold, all that coughs is not COVID in, uh, in, in this scenario. So this is a 32-year-old male. Yeah, his family members developed COVID in September 2020. Patient was completely asymptomatic and he was not tested for some reason that time. He develops cough with expectoration. This is November 2020. He has been seen, he has been seen in, a, uh, in a tertiary care hospital by a pulmonologist. Yeah, and then uh, he was under evaluation and he, he immediately got this uh, label, query post-COVID uh, uh, very post-COVID cough or respiratory illness. He developed fever for three days in Jan 2021. So this is now a few months since symptom onset. And that time he did not get tested for COVID. Finally, they decided that let's uh, do a CT scan for his persistent cough. Uh, of course, his initial CT scan was okay. So this time he uh, changed the doctor and he had a CT scan done. And it's showing ILD with fibrotic NSIP pattern. And um, so they did the bronchoscopy, TB was excluded. And again, he carried the label of post-COVID ILD. Then uh, he had first dose of his COVID vaccine where he developed pulmonary embolism and inflammatory arthritis. So joint pain started. And that is the time they started thinking that let's involve a rheumatologist at this point. When I saw him, he had, had developed clubbing of nails. Well, why he had developed clubbing? So it's to do with ILD. Now his ILD is set in almost a year now since things have started. I noticed this mild thickening of the skin of hands and face. Uh, his uh, SCL70 is positive and his cardiolipin is high. So what do you think was the diagnosis? So he has scleroderma ILD basically. He has scleroderma related disease. Uh, it is very in early stage and started with the lungs. That's why skin symptoms are not uh, very prominent and hence the diagnosis may have been delayed. So very important to remember it well could be something else. And remember the autoimmune rheumatic diseases can have somewhat similar presentation with high CRP and cough. So let's talk about the COVID vaccination in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. So can patients with uh, rheumatic diseases take vaccine? Which one is better? Do patients with rheumatic diseases get worse COVID than the normal population? Do we really need to make changes in their medication, say if they are taking methotrexate or, for example, they are taking steroids? What do we do when they are going for vaccination? Can patients develop post-COVID um, autoimmune rheumatic diseases? We discussed about that. And the treatment of newly diagnosed rheumatic diseases during the pandemic. So question is, can we give immunosuppressants to them? How about who, who has already has the diagnosis of rheumatic diseases and develops COVID-19 positive test and he's completely asymptomatic or the similar patient, but they are symptomatic. What do we do? And when do we restart the treatment, their regular treatment like say methotrexate uh, or sulfasalazine after they have recovered from COVID-19 illness? So these are the questions we'll be discussing. 
So, you know, the great development of COVID-19 vaccine things were really great. We were very happy. But suddenly for us in the, in the rheumatology world, things started very challenging. Patients kept calling and literally from the queue, that maza number alai, and almost needle ardi geliye, and he asked doctor quickly, can I take the vaccine or not? And they were like, or sending someone ki, I'm the patient tithe laini tu bhai, I'm the fourth one now to receive the vaccine, and tell us, can I take the vaccine? And so this has been very challenging in the first few months when the vaccine rolled out. And uh, my practice is I ask every patient to update their prescriptions. Some of them have shown me, uh, visited our clinic maybe two years back or something. So they must update their prescription prior to vaccination. There could be some implications as well. And we need to make sure they have active disease. Uh, so we, sorry, we need to make sure they do not have active disease or unstable disease. They may develop any complication and which will get labeled to the uh, that this is post vaccine. Uh, related complication. So I make sure that patient has uh, has a has a stable disease when they go for the vaccination. So can patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease take the vaccine? So uh, so what's the take? What do you think? Should we send them for vaccination or not? So this is a common question. Sorry. Okay. So yes, uh, almost I put this in my OPD that because this question was asked by so many, now probably it is not that uh, the clarity is there, but yes, that they should get vaccination. However, uh, we should answer a few of their queries. So any specific vaccine for patients with rheumatic diseases? So patients would like to wait for anything specific. So no specific re recommendation. And of, of course it will reduce, the vaccine will reduce the risk of developing severe disease. Live vaccines are usually avoided in patients with rheumatic diseases like yellow fever vaccine and things like that. But none of the current um, early available vaccines in India are considered to be the live vaccine. So they are okay to take these vaccines. So all patients should be encouraged to uh, receive the COVID-19 vaccine. This is regardless of their treatment regime they are on or the underlying diagnosis. So everyone should think about getting the vaccination. Do patients with uh, rheumatic diseases get worse COVID than the normal population? Maybe, yes, uh, there are conflicting studies, but the risk of poor outcome is higher than the general population, particularly if patient has the comorbidities. So when should you delay the vaccine? So is there any time when a patient comes to ask you that can I go for the vaccine and you tell them that let's wait for a few weeks. So if patient is having active infection or they have active disease, in that case, I suggest that wait, let's wait, because if they develop any post-vaccine complication, we will not know whether it is related to the disease or something else and has received rituximab. So be careful. This drug we use um, in rheumatology and oncologists use as well. Many neurologists use for various uh, illnesses. So rituximab is a biologic therapy. It will wash out all the antibodies. So if, if someone has had received rituximab, you need to wait for three to six months for the vaccination. Otherwise the antibodies to the vaccine will not develop. So say someone has received the COVID-19 vaccine, we wait for a month if possible, um, before we go ahead with the rituximab therapy. Otherwise, again, the antibodies will get washed out with rituximab. So it is given intravenously uh, rituximab injections. So any specific vaccine related risk for patients with uh, uh, rheumatic diseases So no sp any specific uh, side effect is anticipated in our patients, the regular things. Post COVID vaccine flare is a possibility. So some patients report that their rheumatic diseases get a flare up after the vaccination. And we are seeing this, uh, particularly with uh, some rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis patient, I have come across this. So any change in the medication required. So one important thing is it should be decided by the treating doctor. So it's a balance between the active disease and the, uh, the, the risk of developing the COVID-19 illness and the need for the vaccination. So if disease is stable, then you, wish, you should consider following things. If the steroid dose is too high, then the vaccine will not work. 
So one should go for the vaccination only when the steroid dose is uh, low, which is which should be like less than five or ten milligram. But uh, you, even if in patients who is ill and their steroid dose you have achieved less than twenty milligram and they are stable, then they can go for vaccination. If steroid dose is more than twenty milligram, then again the antibody response will not be great after the vaccination. NSAIDs for 24 hours before vaccination. So remember, I will clarify this, pay attention to this point. There is no problem giving NSAIDs after the vaccination. You can give NSAIDs or the paracetamol, no problem. Prior to vaccination, 24 hours, in some patients, we give regular NSAIDs, like in case of ankylosing spondylitis. So it has been suggested that you should hold for 24 hours before the vaccination. It comes mainly from the pediatric studies that there could be low antibody response. So if, if your patient is on methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, tell them that they, if their disease is stable and if their rheumatologist is okay with it, hold methotrexate for one week after each dose of vaccination. If patient is on JAK inhibitors like uh, uh, like uh, tofacitinib or baracitinib, we need to hold it for a week after each dose of vaccination. If they are on mycophenolate, then you need to hold it for one week after each dose of vaccination. Hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, azathioprine, cyclosporine, apremilast, no change in the medications required. So they can continue this medication as it is. So how about the biologics prior to vaccination? Probably you will not come across this much. So I will quickly go through this. Anti-TNF can be continued. Tocilizumab can be continued. Secukinumab can be continued. Only rituximab is something we need to be aware of. So there are ACR guidelines. You can go through this. The, the Whatever I have discussed about the vaccination is based on the ACR guidelines where the um, uh, infectious disease specialist, rheumatologist, they have developed these guidelines. You can go through this uh, if interested. So use of immunosuppressive drugs for rheumatic diseases during pandemic and in asymptomatic and symptomatic disease. So in the early phases of pandemic, we were very cautious. We were not sure can we give all these drugs which we normally uh, use in patients with rheumatic diseases. So it is quite clear that we must follow the routine treatment protocol and if possible, of course, keep the dose of uh, steroids minimum possible. Uh, avoid rituximab if uh, any alternative drug is available. If patient is asymptomatic, then sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine can be continued and um, usually wait for two weeks if patient develops severe symptoms or not. And if patient has symptomatic COVID-19 illness, then I suggest we must hold off disease-modifying drugs or biologics for two weeks. So again, I would like you to point out to this, oh, please pay attention to this point. If you come across a patient with rheumatic diseases on immunosuppressive drugs, they develop any infections which requires them hospitalization or requires them uh, antibiotics, hold off their immunosuppressive drugs like methotrexate or sulfasalazine or any of those for two weeks because they may develop complications related to the, uh, to the drugs as well during these two weeks. If you continue, say, methotrexate during the, during the infective phase, they will develop cytopenias and uh, other uh, complications. So reinitiating re -initiating the treatment following the course. So your patient has recovered. So you can restart the treatment after two weeks. Again, of course, it depends on the extent of lung involvement, renal function, various things. So all this, uh, so the COVID, thanks to COVID, basically it has brought rheumatology in uh, limelight and a lot of our drugs have been used. But remember, all these drugs were not specifically designed for rheumatology. If you look at infliximab, it was initially designed for treating uh, sepsis, uh, similar to these anti-TNF drugs. Tocilizumab was developed for multiple myeloma. Rituximab was initially used for lymphoma. And then later on, they realized it's used in various other autoimmune diseases. So uh, I'm coming to my last slide. So vaccination, so let's, let's, let's post COVID arthritis. So it is rare associated with severe disease, involved rheumatologist, if patient has musculoskeletal symptom lasting for more than six weeks. Vaccination treating the underlying disease is very important. We don't tell patient blankly that stop all your drugs for two weeks or something like that. It should be individualized which drugs you want to talk or uh, start or you want to continue or which you want to uh, hold for a few weeks. 
with all uh, disease modifying drugs during the acute infection in patients with rheumatic diseases, if they develop acute infections, then hold off the immunosuppressive drugs for two weeks and then follow the ACR guideline for the vaccination. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to take questions if you have uh, any. So I will stop the slide share. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, is there any evidence or experience of developing calcific tendinitis after COVID infection, especially in elderly patients? Okay, thank you. Interesting question. Again, these are poorly understood um, diseases. Calcific tendinitis is fairly common. We do not know the cause of calcific tendinitis. So, and it is, it does not cause much symptoms. It is there for many years before it causes symptoms. So, it may not be directly related to COVID. It has been there earlier and just now they are developing more aches and pains and that's how it got diagnosed. It won't develop over next, it won't develop over a few weeks or few months. The calcification process starts years before we see, we, it gets detectable on ultrasound or MRI scan. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one more question. What is the dose and duration of uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine treatment? In which disease we are talking about? Yeah. They haven't mentioned that. Randomly not asked, given the disease. Okay. Asked. It's a question. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it, de it depends which disease we are talking about, but we use for a long term, in particularly in patients with lupus, we use more often than in rheumatoid arthritis. And it is for many, many years, basically. <laughs> The dose is usually 200 milligram or 400 milligram. So five to six milligram per kilogram is the dose calculation for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes, sir, uh, is it true that COVID did not get very serious in rheumatic cases? Because these patients are already on uh, HCQS or some high-end anti-inflammatory agents. Yes, I, ju I just read that question from Dr. Shroff. Excellent question. Yes. Very interesting. So initial data, particularly from Italy, showed that patients who, are, who, are, who have rheumatic diseases, they are not getting as bad COVID compared to the general patient. These were some initial indicators. But, the, but there are, of course, conflicting studies later on and showing that uh, they are not spared. But initial thought was that either they, they have some protective antibodies already developed in them because of the autoimmune disease or they have been on hydroxychloroquine. There is no clear consensus on that. And yes, this is a very interesting point and still a lot of research is going on. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your very elaborative and interesting lecture. And uh, as usual, you have given very important take-home messages and you have answered all the questions. Thank you very much. I request our President-elect, Dr. Meenakshi Deshpande, Madam, to felicitate Dr. Praveen Patil, sir. Thank you, Dr. Praveen Patil, sir, for an excellent talk and a good deliberation after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I am a follow Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Lord. Now I request uh, Dr. Alka Shilsagar, Madam, to introduce the next speaker. The next lecture is on bone death uh, syndrome in hip joint post-COVID. Dr. Ashish Arbad is going to give this lecture. He is a MCH, Ortho, RCS, UK, MS, Ortho, Mumbai, internationally acclaimed joint replacement and arthroscopic surgeon. He is currently at Jangir Speciality Hospital as head, joint replacement and robo align surgeon Pune, and joint replacement and orthoscopic surgeon with Aster and Pearl Hospital Pune and uh, Kari Hospital Mumbai and Sayadri Deccan Pune. He is currently among the top three surgeons for shoulder cases instead, successfully treated renowned sports personalities from IPL, Pro Kabaddi, and Boxing League. Uh, he's a uh, faculty, uh, MMC register speaker, guest faculty speaker, uh, Dundee University, Edinburgh, UK, for MCH orthopedic uh, course, National Organizing Secretary, Indo-European 
Arthroscopy Academy, Link Academy Faculty, Germany, Johnson & Johnson National Faculty, India, Smith & Nephew Arthroscopy National Faculty, India, Bombay Orthopedic Society Shoulder Faculty. Uh, he's got many inter community and international associations. Uh, there are nine names, more than nine names. And his research is uh, development of 3D robotics, artificial intelligence, robotic planning, and development of first physical robot for orthopedics in India. He's got uh, five uh, publications, th two international and three uh, national. And one more uh, uh, point I want to say that he's a very good writer. He's got a, a prize in our uh, IMA comp uh, writing comp uh, essay competition on uh, uh, Maza Sakshatkari uh, COVID uh, lockdown. So I remember that because I was a judge that time. So thank you very much, sir. And over to you, sir. Morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Namaskar. Today, Guru's Day is today. Today, Guru's Day is today. We are Guru. I lost my father as a COVID warrior because he went to see a patient as a GP and I, we lost him in March. So I bow down to him also because he was 75 and still he was seeing patients. So, COVID, uh, COVID uh, has shown us a lot of uh, things, but yes, we are doctors and we need to uh, always help the community. So today uh, I thank IMA for organizing this wonderful talk on COVID. An excellent talk by Dr. Praveen and Dr. Amit. Uh, I would like to take a different route, which we are seeing the complications post treatment of COVID. And uh, let me share my screen. So we are talking on something called as bone death syndrome. Uh, everything is clear? Am I audible? Masters? Yes, sir. The slides are visible. Yeah. So we do a lot of robotic joint replacement surgeons in uh, surgery in Jahangir and ONP and Sayadri. But what we knew, newly are seeing as uh, previous lectures, because of COVID-19 and the treatment, we don't know exactly what is the reason. Is, is it those immunosuppressants? Is it those uh, steroids or remdesivir? Uh, we don't know. This is the prevalence of uh, COVID infection as Indian uh, subcontinent and Southeast Asia is concerned. Especially in India, there were around 3 crore cases of COVID. Around then, on 18 lakh patients were hospitalized, which were more up to 64 years of age. We are talking about people in the younger age group. And out of them, 10 lakh patients were given steroids uh, in some way or the other. Near about 3 lakh people have developed avascular necrosis of the hip after uh, this therapy. And in India, there are near 4 to 5 lakh people who are taking non-hospitalized uh, uh, steroids and other drugs. And they are off the radar because might be they are not coming in the consensus of all the data. So near about 7 to 8 lakh people are developing avascular necrosis of the hip. So what is this avascular necrosis of the hip? There were uh, other causes of avascular necrosis. We had fracture, dislocations of the hip. And there is something called SCFE, subslip capital femoral epiphysis, which occurs in children. Uh, there was always uh, non-traumatic causes and we had a lot of rheumatoid causes which Dr. Praveen told. But here, the corticosteroid and the Id idiopathic things are taking over and you see the huge volume of patients. Near about, near about 9 lakh people in India are going to suffer or are suffering in some way or the other with bone death syndrome or avascular necrosis of the hip. There was uh, a big important paper published by Dr. Sanjay Agarwala in 2021 uh, and as a part of long COVID in the second wave, uh, he said that 58 days after COVID, the symptoms started increasing and uh, near about uh, prednisolone, which was given 400 to 1250 milligram is mostly used in these patients. And yes, most of them had taken uh, remdesivir also. So we don't know. Uh, it generally takes six months to a year to develop avian post steroids, but in COVID patients, it is developing within 60 days 
or a month and we are seeing in pune especially uh, the setups that we work at least 3 to 4 patients in our avian opd who are post covid and the covid is 2 months 3 months all are young people most of them have taken steroids and remdesivir so initially it was 6 months to 1 year now it is coming from uh, say 2 to 3 months and which is very notable and we all need to uh, be very vigilant about it and the point to make in this lecture is if you get any patient with mild symptoms of hip pain or si joint pain uh, you can have over diagnose is as early avian so how do we do that so what happens actually uh, it's a sars uh, covid is a sars uh, virus and it always triggers the macrophage and tumor necrosis factors and you know they basically release thrombus there is vascular thrombosis and the clotting factors always clog the arteries and these when the arteries are clogged the venous drainage is clogged and that ultimately leads to arterial clogging and they start developing avascular necrosis since the hip is supplied by only one artery as a circle it is the first one to get affected so what happens in covid 19 coagulopathy also in the coagulopathy there is endothelopathy there is vasculitis and microvascular macrovascular thrombotic events and which happen at the capillary level and as you know they get a kawasaki like a syndrome but end of the day they get avascular necrosis of the soft bone and this is published in the new england journal of medicine in this uh, year 2020 so steroid induced talking about covid induced avian and steroid induced again there is a fat hypertrophy there is bone marrow stem cell that are changing there is incomplete emulsification of uh, the very low density lipoproteins and there is a fat embolus and lot of ffp produced by the hydrolysis of this fat target intraarticular vasculitis and they target the smaller vessels at the capillary level and coagulation starts taking place and avian sets in so now here we can typically see the vessel that is single vessel that is medial circumflex artery which supplies the hip and if something goes wrong here which does because of hypercoagulability the complete epiphyseal arteries stop getting blood supply only the ligamentum teres supplies it and this whole head starts getting necrosed and that is known as bone death syndrome and avascular necrosis and because the larger epiphyseal arteries are also clogged because of the venous clogging so this is what happens once the blood supply disrupts the bone starts getting necrotic and the size of the head gets completely destroyed and this is known as avian how do we diagnose this so now as uh, uh, medical practitioners cumulative dose of 2000 mg prednisolone has completely one of the is known as one of the big, biggest reason for getting uh, avascular necrosis there was there are a lot of papers from us there are some papers from uh, short course from uh, dr macky she is working in uh, france uh, they developed avian only with 850 mg they are not not more, more 15 20 patients and that is very early and as uh, dr agarwala from mumbai in british medical journal 758 mg of prednisolone uh, only in 50 days they developed uh, avian and which is a notable factor in especially in young young people and especially males the normal duration as we all know has 6 to 1 year now it has come down to 58 days which is very very notable so we have to be very very particular in your clinic when a patient comes to you as a general practice you ask him history of steroids please go ahead and ask him are you having any pain in the hip or any discomfort around the area in the groin area uh, and we can really save his hip uh, if not uh, his other symptoms so what do they have as clinicians they have pain in the groin and buttocks which radiates might be to the knee there is intense pain especially during rest and palthi kartana tana jasta pain hota and during movement there is always may be or may not restricted uh, range of movement that comes in the lesser stage loss of mo mobility comes in the other stages because i'll be showing you the stages and in the last stage there is disproportionate limb length so this is what happens when there is a last stage we should not get to this stage 
and are there any therapies we can just we are going to talk about that so there are a lot of classifications in the mri and i'll just brush because there are four to five big classifications what we should know is the earlier the come so there is a ficat classification from france tenberg from uk there is arco from us japanese and michel but we we more focus on the ficat so how to diagnose on the x ray if everybody can appreciate there is no change in the stage 1 but mri will always show some uh, changes in the stage 1 and stage 2 and this is the this is a normal hip this is how the avascular necrosis looks like and the confirmatory diagnosis of mri uh, of uh, avian hip is always an mri of t1 and t2 weighted images so uh, this is a ficat we can just progress uh, uh, i'll just talk through you so the stage 1 stage 2 is where there is a mild collapse but the cortical bone is intact the stage 3 is where the cortical bone less than 50% involved and stage 4 arthritis is set in so we have to prevent these two stages to prevent total hip replacement so if you can appreciate in the x ray there is a flattening of the area this is a stage 2 disease or stage 3 disease where there is cortical bone breakage we should there are treatments which can prevent this and i'll be coming that in a, a few further slides and this is the last stage where we need to do a hip replacement and in young people to avoid that we need to intervene within the first 3 4 months of setting of avian and not to delay it to a year where they will go in stage 4 we how do we diagnose it there is a cabal angle uh, that we see in the mri doctor will it collapse if the cabal angle in the mri is more than 190 there is a high chance of collapse and the patient going in for a thr if the cabal angle is maintained less than 1 uh, 200 degrees we might do what is known as uh, osgrow or a regrow therapy where we give a uh, modified activated osteoblast with stem cells and that's i'll be talking about in a moment so again these are all the classifications that we use again the arco classifications depends on area of involvement and where we can diagnose when we can send a patient to us doctor whether it will collapse or not there are calculations on the mri which we can say whether the uh, cell therapy or a thr might be required to this patient so our focus right now remains is to prevent a total hip replacement in any of these patients so this is again a mri uh, the t1 weighted image where the water content is high there is a re- there is a react to interface between these two you can very very clearly seen in the t2 is the best way to know it because there is something called as a double sign here is a normal bone and here is the avascular necrosis and there is in between fibrous area or a fatty neck fatty uh, hypo intense line so it is known as a double line that's a blue line that is seen there and this is bone sclerosis so the other classifications go in coronal t1 weighted we need, we can clearly see a change in the f- area which is avascularly necrosed it is fat like in the t2 it's more blood like and this is these are the changes that we see again we can see the cabal angle to f- know whether it is going to collapse or not in stage c stage 3 and in this is completely fibrous in the stage 4 where we might have to uh, think about it's a gray zone for a depending on the age whether to go for a hip replacement to wait or to do this cell therapy so is there any any solution for this to prevent the head collapse whether to for preventing the subchondral uh, fractures to prevent the de- degenerative diseases and loose bodies in younger people yes so what we now uh, do Uh, is biotech again we are into a lot of robotic surgeries we are doing a lot of high tech work so now even the biotechnology the biotechnic engineering uh, are making live osteoblast the cells that make the bone see understand it's the it's the colla- it's the cancellous bone that is dying and the process of uh, forming of the cancellous bone is been killed the cortical bone is still there it's not collapsed so if we can start triggering a new formation of this cancellous bone by somehow we can really make the reversal of this avian so how do we do that simple we need to culture the bone forming cells and what are those cells 
osteoblast and chondroblast today the science has gone to that level biotech that we can from the bone marrow we can develop osteoblast and chondrocytes within 4 weeks and from 4 million cells to 100 million cells that's one cr cells we can just put it in that bad area after scooping it i'll be showing you what we do the so whole idea is to start the process of remodeling of the bone the bone remodels every 14 to 20 days so now in avian the process has stopped so the bone is dying if we can start again the process the patient goes back to normal and reverses within couple of months and he has never to go for a totally replacement so typically the patients what i saw they have lot of pain and this is what happens to their hip hip it's called a hip joint attack like a heart attack or a brain attack we need to, so to either they used to do a core decompression the uh, initial treatment of core decompression was focused on releasing the pressure inside but since we did not put osteoblast it failed and total hip replacement is a good option now we are doing robotic hip replacements but for young people again if there is anything available we can really do it to prevent a total hip replacement because less than 40 years of age doing a total hip replacement the patient might end up how better it is in 30 years for a revision so what we do can we regrow the cells can you rebuild your lifestyle yes we can there are certain us fda approved companies that we work what we do is so world's first fda approved permanent and easy natural bone cell therapy what we do is we extract bone marrow cells then is uh, the sample is transported to the lab uh, the company that handles here is regrow life sciences they isolate the culture of osteoblast they activate them and there's a quality control as usual and we get those cells from like in 40 ml of bone marrow that we aspirate it's an opd procedure we get around 4 to 6 million cells but when we send it to lab for culture we can make it into 1 crore or 100 million cells and those are reinstalled in the uh, ot how we do it so what does that do it accelerates the bone formation it's a very minimally invasive procedure it supports natural bone growth and reversal of the bone growth and it's a very very short recovery time only thing we should remember is it should not be collapse it should be grade from, from grade 1 to grade 3 so other places that we are using it uh, osteoblast sculpture or osgrow is non union of fractures bone defects in limb lengthening we are doing couple of limb lengthening and fibrous dysplasias and in some cases where there is maxillofacial defect because of cancers so we invest around 4 ml step 2 this is how we get the cells and this this the from the bone marrow it's an opd procedure it when we do it we are doing it quite regularly uh, not more than 5 to 7 minutes we just collect the bone marrow and send it to the lab now bone marrow biopsy the stage 1 this is how the cells are cultured over 4 weeks and we get a, a 100 million cells of only osteoblast and chondroblast from the stem cells after culture for the new bone formation these are quality tested and then we inject it in the body this is a small video of the surgical demonstration i hope everybody hears it well sound sir we are not audio the video is audible. not audible yeah i told the it guy to make me a host okay okay i'll i'll talk to him because that time it was audible yeah if is not audible i will give a running commentary no problem ha kela tani talu kela shall i start let's see yes i think if you are giving a running commentary we can start so clinically what we look in here is the av and that i talk talk to you about the signs of changes this is a t2 and a t1 weighted image and here we can see that double line sign that i showed you 
So what we do once we get those cells after bone marrow aspiration, this is a typical setup. These are the cells from the lab. These are each has around 5 million, uh, 50 million cells, near about 200 million cells are around here, which are cultured and activated. These remain active for 12 hours. Within these 12 hours, we have to inject those cells after core decompression. These are the binding agents and this is the syringe that combines the cells in with thrombin and other proteins so that we can inject it in the avascular area. So after that, what we do is there is a typical uh, setup where the patient is taken under video CT scan, uh, C arm image intensifier and with a percutaneous guide wire placement, we go in the area of the AVN here, look at, look here. So what we do is, and then now there is a lesion which is very, very clearly seen. It has to be CT based C arm at a high quality C arm. And then these are the typical instruments used for drilling and scooping out the bad bone. So once we drill it, so everybody can appreciate we are going in the lesion. It's very important that we don't break the cortex and it's all percutaneous. Once we done, we scoop out the bad bone, every bit of the bad bone so that there are void form and that bad bone we flush out with, see this, this is the bad necrotic bone that has been flushed out with copious lavage. We flush out every bad bone till a healthy bleeding starts. This is done under regional anesthesia, patient is totally conscious. And just see, it is just two centimeter incision. And again, then a needle is placed and then we inject the cells inside the area. This is how it is done. Now here are the cells and here are the proteins. And this forms the soil, uh, the hypo is not available. And what happens is, now this, this is what this do, does is it makes the process start for osteoblastic activity. So all, all of us remember anatomy and physiology, what we studied during our, this thing uh, in our second year and third year MBBS, that the process every 14 days, osteoblasts come, osteoclasts eat some part of the bone, osteoclasts eat it and the osteoblasts form it, osteoclasts eat it. So imagine I am going to put 100 crore cells as osteoblast there, removing all the bad bone. What happens is these cells start process of regrowing the new osteogenic cells and osteoblast. So what happens is once the process starts every 14 days and 20 days, these cells start developing new osteoclastic cells or developing new osteoblastic cells and re reducing the avascular necrosis of the hip. Now, these are a lot of papers which are compared osteogenic potentials of osteolog uh, osteologus osteoblast, which are cultured near about 6 to 12 weeks, they start reversing. This is the only therapy available to prevent avascular necrosis from progression. Doctor, if I give some medicines, if I give some bisphosphonates, will it work? The blood supply there is cut. Since there is no blood supply, there is no agent or there is no media that will carry medicines there. Once I do this, we can shift them on medical therapy also. I have to decompress it put osteoblast in huge numbers, 200 times more, so that the avian reverses. There are n number of patients from Korea, US, that shows that only bone marrow uh, injection or only core decompression or only medicines don't help. We have to decompress that bad area. We have to remove the bad bone and put osteoblast, which we are regularly doing, known as the regrowth therapy. So this is uh, the whole idea started with this paper from missing diamond stem cells from Korea. Uh, Dr. Jung, Lim, Jung Kim is a big, big researcher in this. And he started doing allogenic cancellous bone granules injection 
now we have gone to the sixth stage of giving activated osteo uh, osteoblast with chondroblast and believe me it is really working miracles again this is a case report uh, of avascular completely reversed from 2004 the research is going on and this is the latest paper in 2021 where there is 81% success rate in grade 1 and grade 2 and grade 3 and 60% success rate in grade 4 patients to prevent so what is this success rate is prevention and reversal of avian prevention of totally preplaced from for the next 10 years to 15 years or complete reversal with cortical bone uh, protection so uh, again from 2004 the research paper again by dr jung kim it showed complete reversal in the patients where he had put autologous recultured cells versus there is a therapy where you just take cells as some doctors doing it they put a bone marrow and the patients on one side this is a very important paper one side they put only freshly taken bmac or bone marrow aspirate and other side cultured over a month osteoblast and they have seen significant reversal on the side of activated autologous osteoblast from the cultured side and this shows that we have an answer for avascular necrosis only thing we have to diagnose it early accept it and this is a percutaneous therapy is totally covered under most of your claims but it has to be done in time like angioplasty thank you for other details you can log on to my website there are a lot of videos and surgical techniques there and i am open for any question on this topic i hope it was not very technical no no sir it was very nice lecture with uh, all uh, your uh, video and uh, all the slides they were very good and very explanatory uh, there is no question uh, is here but i wanted to know the cost of this uh, therapy it is uh, 300 and 3.5 lakh per side because the okay. cells cells are very costly uh, okay. the core decompression and everything is covered by the mediclaim but the cells uh, the company for this regrowing it's it's it's, yeah. it's a genetic uh, transformation thing so i think it is uh, there it's tied up with jahangir uh, we have the lowest rate but i think it is 3 around 3 3 1/2 lakh for one side Okay. okay. So it was really a eye opener for me. Uh, it is an excellent therapy, actually, because lot many patients, uh, being a radiologist, ask us what is the further treatment for this uh, AVN. Because uh, since many years uh, we were not able to answer the question, but uh, now we are sure that this is a very good technique uh, to cure the AVN patients. Uh, and and we'll get... uh, if I can add, sir, we are uh, we will be announcing a separate because of this COVID, post COVID era, we are announcing a separate AVN OPD that will be a particular day. We are going to see only AVN patients. We have videos, we have uh, grading systems, we have lot of you know it, AVN OPD will be having educative format for the patient also. Uh, medical therapy. Every patient doesn't require this, but we can we have that will be announcing to IMA so that. everybody of us can get benefit of this uh, avian and we can come out of this and prevent a, a early thr yes sir it needs to be propagated a lot because it's a good therapy even i have a patient right now i will uh, i'll tell i'll ask him to contact you yeah very nice right, that sir. was Thank a very, very excellent talk but there's one more um, little bit of how many days this effect will last you feel or this is a lifetime um, this is this is like this is like angioplasty so it okay. is it is reversal we have to reverse it it is lifetime what stage you come to us that's that determines the success rate okay okay yes. and the prognosis also i think yes and yes. yes we would be more happy to do a totally preplacement because that's what we primarily do but preventing we are doctors first we are scientists first uh, uh, we should always give patient an option of conservative therapy and i feel the new era of conservation is this this is a conservative therapy that is a very excellent option for the, the patients who are young aged actually these many of these patients will be young aged and this is a very good option for those yeah. thank you sir thank you sir thank you very thank much you, sir, sir.
Now I will request our president elect Dr. Minakshi Deshpande to felicitate you. Thank you, Dr. Ashish Arbat, sir, for your excellent talk. Thank you very much. And this is IMA Upparane. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now we move on to our uh, next lecture. We all One know. More question, but can we take it? No, no. Uh, we all know uh, COVID is not only a, a physical health problem, but it has also become a mental health problem for the society. The loss of dear ones, loss of jobs, uh, loss of business has caused lots of problems like COVID depression, and anxiety. To enlighten about it, uh, today we have noted psychiatrist Dr. Dhananjay Chavan to speak about post-COVID depression and anxiety. I would take the privilege to introduce Dr. Dhananjay Chavan sir. Dr. Dhananjay Chavan sir is a geriatric psychiatrist. He is consultant at Dinat Mangeshkar Hospital, Aditya Birla Hospital, Health Spring and Mind and Brain Institute in Pune. He is a fellow in geriatric mental health from King George Medical University, Lucknow. Currently co-chair of geriatric psychiatry specialty section of Indian Psychiatric Society. His special interest is in care of elderly. He has designed and ran training courses for senior citizen care for three years. He runs a charity clinic and workshop for elderly for Dignity Home Foundation. Meditation and ancient scriptures. He has conducted medit meditation workshops in over 15 countries, presentations related to uh, digitization of ancient scriptures in various universities in Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, and Korea. He has also written a Marathi book on dementia for family members and caregivers. He has uh, edited Samadhi Marg by Dharmananda Kosambi in Marathi. He has contributed chapters to various books of mindfulness, old age issues and geriatric psychiatry. With this short introduction, I welcome Dr. Dhananjay Chavan sir for his talk on depression and anxiety post-COVID. Sir, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ingle, for your kind. First, uh, let me thank IMA, also my friend, Dr. Minakshi. Uh, yes, I was going to say it. For uh, inviting us, and Dr. Alka. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, today I am going to uh, speak about only three or four very important basic things. Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Amit uh, Dravid, uh, a very optimistic uh, talk and it was good news. We also heard from Dr. Praveen Patil, which brought clarity in certain areas that we also have to deal with when we see patients with autoimmune disorders, especially rheumatoid arthritis, and some exciting uh, uh, news from uh, Dr. Arbert. Uh, what I'm going to speak now is basically uh, some very simple tips about uh, what we see and what can be done in a general uh, practice setting. Hello, problem One minute. Dr. Dhananjay, you want to share your screen? Yes, yes, I want to share my screen. Okay. Do I have the permission? If I can't, it's okay. Even if I can't share, it's no problem. 
No, I don't think there should be a problem. You have got that option below you. Share your screen. So click on the yes, green yes. button, Dr. Dhananjay. Huh? Click on the green button. Okay, I will continue. Rather than wasting time. Okay. So, we all know that. Uh, Siddharth, can you help, sir? Siddharth. Hello? Ah. Hello. Ha. Ha. sir is not able to share the screen. Can you help Siddharth? Okay. Uh, sir, did the Kaliwaga share screen option? Eh? Yes, yes. I have clicked on it, but I am not able to share my screen. So do one thing. I am uh, using it. Hello. Yes. Hello? Uh, do yes, one thing. Sir. Just open your document uh, in background. Yes, it is open. And click a uh, share screen. Yes. I have done selected that. document. Okay, I think we shouldn't waste time. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a very simple. As I said, I'm going to talk about only four or five very simple basic things uh, in post-COVID depression and anxiety. Now, there is twofold impact of uh, COVID. There is a direct impact and there is an indirect impact. Direct impact of disease on our brain, the virus, how it affects our brain and how it causes anxiety and depression. And indirect impact is something that we all have experienced. We all have experienced that uh, we are not able to grieve just think about any time in your life there has been good news or there has been any disastrous news. The first thing you do is you talk to your near and dear ones. The first thing you do is you go and meet them. What has happened in COVID is this simple process of support, emotional support has been affected. There have been just so many solitary hospitalizations, uh, solitary recoveries, and lonely recoveries and a lonely grief processes. And that has uh, had a huge impact on the mental health overall. So there is a direct effect and there is an indirect effect of uh, COVID in... Now, how does it affect us in, uh, as a direct effect? Fortunately, severe neurological sequelae because of COVID are not common. So uh, COVID has ravaged us in many ways, as we have seen, uh, even the bones are not spared, but severe neurological sequelae are not known. So that is a good news. However, depression and anxiety are extremely common. The various data from various sources vary but a conservative estimate is that about 25% of post-COVID patients have either depression or anxiety. Remember that this connection between COVID and depression and anxiety is bidirectional. People who have psychiatric illnesses are more likely to have COVID-related complications and people, people who have long COVID especially are more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. This bidirectional relation between COVID and depression and anxiety is not really restricted only to COVID. We see this bidirectional relationship even with many other conditions like heart disease, like autoimmune disorders. So that is why, say, even uh, an in ISD or a disease like autoimmune disorders that Dr. Patil talked about. Oftentimes the depression and anxiety aspect of it is overlooked 
and that has an impact on the other diseases. So this is an important aspect that we have to remember. This is the first point I'm making that it is a bi-directional thing. So treatment of anxiety and depression are important even for other medical conditions and their prognosis. That is also one of the way that anxiety and depression have increased mortality, not just from directly from uh, suicide, which is one of the most um, direct and visible thing that we see, but also from indirect impact. So uh, that is the first point. Now the second point that I'm going to make today is about things that we have to be aware of. As I said, about 25% of post-COVID people have some kind of anxiety and depression. Now, if it is mild, some sleep loss, some cognitive impairment, sometimes poor appetite are common, especially when there is problem with taste and smell. These affect quality of life. This is also one of the pathways whereby they cause depression because our taste and our smell are very important for good quality of life. So there is poor appetite, there is sleep issue, and there is cognitive impairment. This is common in any uh, infective disorder. It is also common in COVID. But if it is mild, if it is short, then we need not worry about it. It is only when these things persist for more than a couple of weeks after the patient has recovered, in our words, when there is no more fever. That is when we have to start thinking about post-COVID depression and anxiety. Now, before we go to depression and anxiety per se, I would like to warn you about three common things. First is caffeine. Caffeine consumption has gone up a lot. It is indiscriminate. Earlier, people used to have tea or coffee at specified time. Nowadays, especially with new generation, caffeine consumption has gone up. Remember, caffeine can give rise to symptoms of anxiety. Now, so many people drink coffee. Should we ask them to stop drinking? to drink or not to drink, that's the question. But the answer is fairly simple. Don't drink coffee or have any caffeinated drink in the second half of the day, simple. Caffeine affects your sleep adversely and sleep is very important for mental health. Whenever I talk to non-medical people, people without uh, medical training, I said these are two best medicines for mental health. One is exercise and one is sleep. So sleep and exercise are very important. What caffeine does is it affects your sleep. And that is why caffeine, you have to be very careful. Second half of the day, don't have caffeine. Secondly, people with anxiety, should they have ca coffee or caffeinated drinks or they shouldn't have? As long as they are having it regularly, it's okay. When it becomes a problem is when suddenly you go on a vacation for two days and you have a lot of coffee there because it is served all the time or there is a coffee machine in the office or in the hotel. So if your caffeine intake is moderate, it is in the first half of the day. And if it is consistent, then you are not likely to have problem. So that is the thing with caffeine. Second important warning is about alcohol. Lot of people have been drinking more during the lockdown. Even in recovery phase from COVID, people drink. Alcohol affects your sleep. Specifically, alcohol affects your ability to dream. I repeat, alcohol affects your ability to dream. So some people may think of alcohol as a nightcap. It is not a nightcap. It affects your sleep architecture. So this is something that you have to ask your patient specifically. Do ask about caffeine intake. Do ask about alcohol. And this is something that is applicable to you as uh, practicing doctors also. Third important thing is sleeping pills. 
as all of us know, people share sleeping pills with friends. And also there is always a friendly chemist around the corner who is willing to dispense it. So always check whether they are getting sleeping pills. And if they have been taking sleeping pills earlier, and then during COVID, some of them stopped, and then there is a withdrawal. So these three substances, generic sleeping pills, so you have to check what they are taking, check alcohol intake, and check caffeine. After warning you about these three things, I will come to the next thing. Anxiety and depression as symptoms and as disorders. Because a depression is also an emotional state. There is none of us who have not felt anxiety in our life. We, we get anxious all the time. So a syndrome is different and a symptom is different. So when is it that we suspect in a post-COVID patient that the person has either anxiety or depression? Generally speaking, for depression, if the person is giving, coming with a complaint of more than two weeks symptoms. So if it is going on for 15, 20 days or longer, where his sleep is affected, where his appetite is affected, where he has lost interest, where there is persistent sadness, where the person feels tired and fatigued all day long, where the person has difficulty concentrating, there is a lot of guilt, there are a lot of negative thoughts. So if this is happening on most days, more days than not. Remember, even a depressed person can function normally, especially if there is a mental strength. Say, I know many doctors who continue to work normally even during a major depressive episode. So ability to function is not the only criteria. There can be subjective stress. But if these symptoms, feeling low, feeling sad, not having interest, if these are there on more days than not, for about 15 days or longer, and if the person is feeling low or sad or irritable for most part of the day, or if there is a variation in the day, then the person is likely to have depressive disorder, a syndrome, rather than just a symptom, which any one of us feel all the time. So that is very important distinction that we must be aware of, of symptom versus syndrome. If it is persistent, if it is uh, affecting your social work or personal life, or is it causing a lot of distress, especially if it is causing sleep disturbances. That is when depression needs to be treated. And treating depression and anxiety will also help whatever comorbid conditions he or she may have. The person may have heart disease, may have hypertension, may have diabetes, may have neurodegenerative conditions. So whatever comorbid conditions the patient has, treating his or her depression and anxiety is going to help in those comorbid conditions as well. Now, Always remember that depression and anxiety are often associated. Sometimes they are, the symptoms overlap so much that one person may give a diagnosis of anxiety disorder and second person may give a diagnosis of depressive disorder because they often coexist. A depressed person is anxious and anxious person is depressed. Now, Two common anxiety conditions that we should be aware of in general practice for everybody. One is panic disorder, where a person suddenly feels extremely anxious. The person feels something has gone wrong and it builds in minutes. So if this sudden anxiety is building in minutes and lasting for anywhere between 10, 20 minutes to about an hour, or half an hour, during which time the person gets all the symptoms of anxiety. Tundala korar parte, dhardhar varte, ghaame to, hatta jatar kapaya lagta, hatta paisa taakad gela sarkjate, potat khadda parto. All these typical things that we use in our languages to describe anxiety. Breaking into sweats, lump in throat, dryness of mouth, 
hyperventilation, uh, palpitation, tremulousness, uh, sinking feeling in the stomach, sinking feeling in the legs, a weakness of limbs, suddenly because of anxiety. These symptoms are common in panic. Most of the panic patients land, land in emergency rooms. So often how they come is, they all feel all this anxiety, they go to a doctor and they get a clean certificate of health. After COVID, this is common. A few patients I have seen during this period is, a family member develops COVID, has a very severe COVID, it has to be put in the ICU, put on the ventilator, or sometimes somebody loses a near and dear one to COVID. And then a susceptible family member gets panic attacks. That is common. So this is a very simple condition to uh, understand and to diagnose. Uh, panic attack, one panic attack does not mean the person has panic disorder. But if there are three or four such episodes, and then they are followed by anxiety about whether I'm going to get this again, whether I'm going to get this anxiety again, whether I'm going to get this sudden panic. And then there is also change in their behavior, what we call as agoraphobia. Now, what happens there is the person doesn't want to go to any place where help is not available or where escape is difficult. Even in your personal life, you will know such people, but typically panic and agoraphobia are associated together. So again, I will repeat what happens in agoraphobia is a person doesn't want to go anywhere where the person feels that help will not be available. So they are generally, uh, they avoid going out of the house alone. They avoid public places. They avoid public transports. They avoid crowded places. They avoid queues because in queues and crowded places, they feel trapped. So these are common anxiety conditions. These are more common after COVID. There is also a generalized anxiety that is more common after COVID. Now, both with anxiety and depression, whether somebody has a severe depressive phase or is more anxious, the treatment combination doesn't change much, but to understand that there is a possibility is very important. One more thing that all of us have to understand, and I think uh, the new generation of doctors understand this better than my generation of uh, doctors is, both depression and anxiety are medical conditions. So this is something that I'm at pains to explain to everybody who is who cares to listen that depression and anxiety disorders are disorders. These are medical conditions where the symptoms are psychological. So the symptoms are psychological, but the etiology, the etiopathology need not be psychological. So what happens, the common thing that happens is we tend to ignore severe symptoms of depression and anxiety because we think that they are proportionate. Oh, he had such a severe COVID episode. He was on ventilator. Oh, it went on for a long time. Oh, he was in ICU or she was in ICU. And now that is why uh, it is normal for two months after recovery, the person is feeling still low and depressed. No. One simple example that I give to my patients, which I would like to repeat here, I go out, I stumble on a stone and I fall down, I develop a fracture. Second scenario, I go out, somebody comes and pushes me. I fall down, I develop a fracture. Whatever the reason is a fracture, it needs to be treated. Similarly, so many times in emotional situations or wherever we suspect that there are, uh, there is a mental health condition, there is tendency to focus whether the stress was proportionate. And if there was a big stress, we tend to assume that it need not be treated because of course he has such a severe COVID. So that was such a shock. 
no what is what decides whether the person needs to be treated is what are the symptoms so like i said if it continues for more than 15 20 days on more days than not for most part of the day if the person is feeling low has no interest then it needs to be treated so this medical paradigm of depression and anxiety is very important to understand we so far did not have any marker biological marker for depression i remember 20 22 years back more than that 25 30 years back in sasun hospital there was only one day when we could get our uh, t3 t4 tested so thyroid thyroid testing was available only once a week in the central library that has changed now any small town also has uh, thyroid testing similarly for depression recently biological markers have been found they will become commercially available in the next few years but till then we have to use our clinical judgment to diagnose these diseases that there are genetic factors in both these disorders was very well known about 15 to 16 genes that were associated with major depressive disorders were, were known they were identified what was lagging was biomarkers but now with mrna technology we have biomarkers available they are in research stage and recently this is in open source nature clinic so anybody can uh, go and uh, read about it so recently there were a few studies published in nature about uh, these mrna biomarkers and soon we will be able to diagnose this condition um, with more precision it will also help us uh, in deciding uh, the treatment options and also what kind of depression it is a, a common problem is recurrent depressive disorder people feel okay but the moment you say bipolar mood disorder or bipolar depression some of there is a anxiety associated with it both these conditions are uh, severe recurrent depressive disorder also in fact is a major cause of disability associated life years loss it is one of the major cause in fact in next 10 20 years depression is going to be among the top 3 causes for morbidity and also among the top 3 causes of a daily loss disability associated life year loss so this is very important now i will come to once we identified you know it's fairly simple uh, as i said it is persisting for a long time there is sleep loss there is appetite problem there is loss of interest there is sadness there is loss of concentration um, lack of confidence there is guilt there is uh, fatigability and one very important symptom that we all must look out for is uh, suicidal tendency whether a person has uh, thoughts of suicide now we all are little squeamish about and asking this question but we need not be you don't have to ask your patient atmatya karavashi vatte ka you can ask asa vatte ka ki jagayla ar jagnatas arth nahi do you feel that there is you have lost interest in life that is a question that you can ask more easily rather than do you feel that you want to commit suicide and then you can move to the next step so you can always and you should always ask if you if you think a person is depressed they are anxious then you must ask whether the person has suicidal thinking and the simple question to ask is asa vatte ka ki jagu ne ki va jagnat arth ne asa vichar eto ka kiwa do you feel that there is no point in life you don't want to live so that is how you can initiate this uh, talk about whether the person is suicidal always remember that asking about suicidal ideation does not increase the risk of suicide i repeat this is very common myth even among uh, health professionals asking about suicidal ideation to a depressed patient does not i repeat does not increase the risk of suicide in fact it decreases 
the person feels better that somebody understands his mental state, that somebody is trying to understand him or her. So this is a question that you should always ask for anybody who is depressed. Now coming to uh, treatment options because we have uh, not much time left. For anxiety, for insomnia, I know that all of you prescribe benzodiazepines, just one care. Explain to the patient that these are to be taken only for short time. Tell them that there is a risk of becoming dependent. So take them only for 10 days, only for 15 days. So do not prescribe long-term benzodiazepines. The commonest thing that I see in practice is that so many of you are very good at diagnosing, but then you put the patient on benzodiazepines. There is good relief in the beginning if there is anxiety but the person continues to take it and then he becomes benzodiazepine dependent. Also avoid using short term, uh, shorter acting benzodiazepines. So use clonazepam instead of alprazolam. Alprazolam is more likely to cause dependent. The shorter acting the benzodiazepine, the more likelihood of the person becoming dependent on it. So try and use longer acting benzodiazepine like clonazepam. Also give the person a specific instruction that this is for a short term that you are anxious. This is post COVID period that you are feeling this anxiety. We need to cover it. So give a specific instruction to the person and the spouse or the family member. So it helps to inform the family member also to avoid the person becoming dependent. Now benzodiazepines give immediate relief and that is why most of you use them. A wonderful, uh, medicine that has come up in last 20, 30 years, more commonly used. And so many of you use it is the group of SSRIs. I think all uh, physicians and general practitioners and other specialists like gynecologists should be familiar with at least one SSRI. Fluoxetine and acetalopram. Now brand name are Nexito, Stalopam, Vexipra, Zitalo, uh, Citopam. So, Estalopram and fluoxetine. One good thing with this, both these medicines is that the initial dose is also the therapeutic dose because often in psychiatry, we have to titrate doses. You have to increase and see the response. But with these two SSRIs, you can use these SSRIs to uh, start the treatment and then use them. One a thing that is very encouraging for psychiatrists to see is that so many of you have started using these SSRIs. So many of you use fluoxetine, so many of you use acetalopramam. One thing that I see is that you use only for a shorter dis uh, duration. So this is the opposite of benzodiazepines. The SSRI action kicks in after a couple of weeks, after three weeks. And so sometimes you diagnose correctly start the patient on acetalopram 10 milligram, and then you give it only for two weeks. And then the medicine is stopped just as it is kicking in. So remember with SSRI, choose your one SSRI, but give it for an extended period. So the onset of action in SSRIs in acetalopram and fluoxetine is delayed. Cover that period maybe with benzodiazepines. So with benzodiazepine, you have to stop it within a couple of weeks or three weeks as early as possible. Whereas with SSRIs, you have to continue it. Remember the major advantage SSRIs have over tricyclic antidepressants that we all are aware and we all see commonly like imipramine, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, uh, trazoline. So both these, uh, all these tricyclics have uh, very uncomfortable side effects. There are a lot of anticholinergic side effects, which is a big issue, especially in elderly population. So SSRIs, the advantage is that they are quite safe. They can be used long-term. In fact, if a person has repetitive depressive disorder, then they have, uh, they protect them from future severe episodes. So use these SSRIs, use benzodiazepines, now uh, coming to the end, encourage the patient to live a healthy life, encourage the patient to go out in nature, 
to have regular physical exercise. And lastly, before I conclude, I repeat, post-COVID depression and anxiety are very, very common, especially after long COVID. Headache is one indicator that people have found that may predict post-COVID depression. So somebody who has significant headache during COVID may get a, uh, depression as a sequelae. Use benzodiazepines only for a short term if there is anxiety. Use SSRIs but give adequate trial. And also don't ignore simple measures like sleep and exercise. I think uh, that's where I would stop. Uh, thank you very much. I have just realized that there is some uh, privacy setting that didn't allow me to share my screen, but that's okay. I hope uh, I was clear enough. Thank you very much. Uh, I hand over to Dr. Minaxi and Dr. Ingwe. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your uh, excellent presentation on depression and anxiety. Uh, it is always very nice to uh, listen from you. Uh, I am sure many of your classmates are also listening to this lecture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. in front of me, I have two of your classmates, <laughs> Dr. Sanjay Patil, sir. Yes, uh, and don't uh, forget me. My mother was treated by Dr. Dhananjaya Chavan. I'm also very much there. I'm listening to each and every word of yes, his. Yes, sir. Talk, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Padma, no, Dr. Padma, thank you. I can hear you. The take home message was given by you. No coffee uh, in the second half of the day. <laughs> Exercise. Yeah. I see some questions. May I quickly yeah, answer one them? More, one more take yes. home message, which was very nice, was that you can ask for any depressed person, you should ask us about the suicidal yes, tendencies. Yes. I think we need to focus yes. on that because that's a very good um, take home message for today. And it doesn't decrease okay, the. Was... Three quick questions I can answer. I see three questions. I will answer them in one sentence. Okay. One question is when should SSRIs be prescribed? Acetylopram can cause drowsiness, it can also disturb sleep. So give it in the morning, but if the patient says he is drowsy, give it at night. If you give it in the night and patient says, my sleep is getting disturbed, shift it in the morning. So with uh, estalopram, uh, there is about 30% people have more drowsiness, 30% people have less drowsiness. Fluoxetine should be given in the morning. So fluoxetine, give it in the morning. Estalopram can be given at any time. Now second, uh, role of melatonin. Melatonin is very safe, can be used easily, but remember that melatonin is useful only for two or three days. So it can be used for jet lag when you want to advance your cycle, but after three or four days, melatonin becomes ineffective. It has no role as a long-term treatment, but in the short term, Sometimes you want to go to bed early today or you are in jet lag phase, then melatonin is excellent, it is safe, especially in senior population. I use melatonin all the time and it works very well. Then there is the question of SSR and alcohol interaction. So I will repeat again, anybody, I tell my patients who are depressed that I don't have a moral view on alcohol. I, I tell them as a doctor, I don't have a moral view. I have a view whether something is helpful to you or harmful to you, not right and wrong. And I'll tell them that if you have anxiety and depression, alcohol is not helpful to you. Alcohol is a uh, CNS depressant. It interferes with your dream, REM sleep, and it, is, it makes you more prone for anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. Also, since we have talked of suicide, a depressed person who also is alcoholic is more likely to commit suicide. So alcohol is an independent risk factor for suicide. Always remember that. So gum bhulane ke liye pite. I have no view. Alcohol has given us excellent shairi, some of the best poetry, but always remember, just counsel the patient not to drink alcohol. But if at all they are drinking, they can continue to take SSRIs. With benzodiazepines, it should never be mixed warn your patient not to drink when they are taking benzodiazepines, but with SSRI, they can have a peg or two if they must. Now there is, uh, how can you help a post-COVID patient who, is, uh, who doesn't accept that his anxiety needs treatment? 
look, when you send the person to psychiatrist, the person gets upset, but you can help him. You can help him about it. Uh, counseling about caffeine use of alcohol use, regular sleep, regular exercise, short-term benzodiazepines, or SSRI. So uh, I think all of us have to start learning to treat anxiety and depression, at least at the first step. Only when you get stuck, you send to a psychiatrist. That can also work. Okay, now I will hand over to Dr. Minakshi and Dr. Ingle again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very Thank you, much. Sir. Now I request uh, our president-elect, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, Madam, and our executive trustee, Dr. Patil, sir, to felicitate Dr. Dhananjay Kaur. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Dhananjay, for an excellent talk. And uh, you have been an asset to IMA Pune, actually. Namaskar, sir. Namaste. Namaste. This is for you, Dhananjay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is IMA Uparna. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for a very well articulated talk and a very good take home messages with, I think, a pulse of wisdom of psychiatry, which we never understand actually. But now, today, we have understood very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, I request uh, my co secretary, Dr. Alka Shivsagar, madam, to introduce and invite Dr. Mudassar Sheikh. Hello. Uh, good morning and welcome, uh, Dr. Mudassar Sheikh. Are you there? Yes, he is. Yes, yes, I'm quite here. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Mudassar Sheikh, he is an interstitial at KM Hospital, Pune, and he's, uh, today's, uh, he's given a very short introduction. Uh, uh, sir, you can tell or uh, you can show your first slide if you, you have got a uh, CV. And uh, your topic is very interesting, waterless bathing revolution. So we are going to listen uh, something very different uh, topic is there. So over to Dr. Uh, Mudassar Sheikh. Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, is it visible? Is my, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, we can see your slides, Dr. Sheikh. Okay, Thank excellent. You. Firstly, uh, so I'm Dr. Mudassar Sheikh. I work as an intensivist in KEM Hospital, Pune. And I'm very excited and delighted to be here and present this very interesting topic. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Ingle, Dr. Minakshi and Dr. Alka for introducing me. And uh, since morning, I think we have gone through quite interesting lectures presented by Dr. Dravid, Dr. Patil, Dr. Chavan and Dr. Arbat. Now, since uh, you know this, this topic is very precise, very crisp, and very to the point. And even though it may seem that it is about a new product that has come, uh, that has come to India, that has come to the ICUs for use, but we should also know that the importance of it and what it has revolutionized and how it has revolutionized patient care. So, as with uh, everything in the ICU, we've seen uh, most of the patients that we like to. Uh, that we are tackling right now are related with infections and infection control. So our target is try to reduce infections as much as possible. And to do that, very small and very, uh, you know, very innovative things are being thought of day in and day out. And this is a part of the new revolution of infection control and prevention that is taking place all over our country. Now, with further ado, I'd like to go ahead with uh, present my slides. Now, the infection prevention in ICU basically is uh, mostly related with patients who are, you know, uh, bedridden, who are in the ICU for a long time, and they have take, they are more vulnerable to gram positive, gram negative infections. Even with great advances in medical technology, these patients continue to be at a greater risk of infections that are both often avoidable. And, you know, you can just take small steps in avoiding these kind of complications. So the sources of infection, as we all know, comes from touching an infected person or an object or contaminated hands, which is the major source of uh, cross-contamination that happens. The communicable in, uh, infections or the agents that cause indirect diseases transmission does not require direct connection. Or, if, or uh, you know, you can just have aerosols that originated from coughing and sneezing of patients that may carry the pathogens all towards the other 
patient that is that could be just next door or you can have the healthcare worker who could also be you know uh, an agent to transmit these diseases for four distinct uh, now th these are the four distinct areas that stand out as uh, uh, as you know the concentrate of infection control where we should focus on for controlling the infection first one would be preventing the contact of transfer then would be improving the surface cleaning of the uh, of the various surfaces that are in and around the patient preventing the device related infections that means we are talking about anything that could be just the ecg leads right up to the central line and uh, you know i cannot stretch, stress it much as to how important it is uh, for the strict hand hygiene protocols okay so now maintaining personal hygiene is one of the major pillars of infection control and how do we do that is by paying specific attention by keeping one is to one uh, nursing ratio and by maintaining strict protocols of hand hygiene and taking care of patients hygiene and you know uh, trying to pay attention to where are the vulnerable vulnerable areas how and what the patient is presenting what is his prognosis how long is he going to be with us and so uh, henceforth now hygiene of the skin is most important because as we all know skin is the largest organ on the body and protecting the skin and maintaining personal hygiene of the patient creates a sense of you know a freshness a sense of self esteem it increases the self esteem and definitely you can sort out many more problems that are related with uh, infection control now the techniques used for maintaining personal hygiene as we all know one which is quite tedious and difficult is bed bathing of a patient now bed bathing even though it is not as effective as showering but it should always uh, it should only be undertaken when there is no alternative if a bed bath is required it is important to offer patient the opportunity to participate on their own care now this would this what happens is that patient feels more independent they feel more uh, self esteem and they feel more dignified now even though bed bathing is uh, quite effective there are some general principles that we need to keep in mind first of all that uh, we need to keep in mind that the patient needs to be warm all the time you cannot just keep a patient open and uh, start cleaning him and sponging him and giving him bath because that will definitely lead to more hypothermia now the position uh, uh, you need to keep a linen in position near the patient so that the disposable linen can be immediately used to reduce uh, microorganisms and dead skin and the other contaminated materials into the environment now only expose the areas of the body of the patient which needs to be washed you do not need to expose the entire patient and like we already mentioned that we need to keep the patient warm also now while we do this it is also some other factors also come into play that you can also uh, monitor the patient's skin whether they have been having pressure sores or they have had some injuries or they have had some wounds that were not visible otherwise now the other way is that you can start the technique would be that you need to pat the skin and dry and reduce the risk of friction damage now that also it could lead to you know bed sores and as we all know bed sores is a big indication of medical negligence <clears throat> cross contamination now uh, bathing should be should improve the patient's hygiene remove the microbes and decrease the potential of infection that we all know now how do we do that is that we have also seen that the studies that have shown that the basins that are used uh, for a cleaning or in the process of cleaning the patient those are the major source where the basins have got around 90% 90 to 98% of the organisms that go from there now major problem is that we are unable to keep the basins dry and maintain the hygiene continuously and that is one of the reasons of that the infection spreading is become so common now skin integrity as we know is very vital for avoiding any kind of uh, you know breaching into the skin would lead to the risk of infection and studies have shown that soap and water washing can have a direct and indirect impact on the uh, epidermis by uh, posing a number of threats into the skin integrity now soap can also remove the resident flora as well as natural lipids that are actually used in the protection of our skin now holding the capacity of the skin the thin layers of the uh, of the corneum and the and uh, the diseases of the natural skin are you know the main main idea is to keep the skin lubricated to keep it more supple and to keep it more fresh 
now there is an uh, there is a tent, uh, tainted evidence of the skin damage increasing the frequency of bed uh, bed baths and also increases now a body bath can be in a liquid form or a bar form the main active ingredient in the body bath is generally a surfactant now which provides the cleansing action against the dirt dust and oil now these are the things that actually have or harbor most of the uh, infections and lead to cross contamination now body bath may be also having some additional properties like a an antimicrobial or an antiseptic or an antifungal uh, thing and nowadays they have also started including fragrances also into that to make the patient feel more fresh now body bath has already of two types you know wet and dry and the wet body bath are quite effective now they require the use of ample amount of water which is now become a commodity that we really need to focus on saving which is extremely precise now uh, precious to us sorry the most uh, most of the bo uh, wet body bath contains harmful substances like alcohol paraben and uh, uh, harmful surfactants now on the other hand if we have dry body bath they are the ones with which have reduced use of water now if we are thinking of wet we see that we are, we are landing up spending or uh, you know using more of the water and with dry we are using less however since since no water is uh, required the waterless dry body bath can be used even with people in areas where you know uh, the campers or the backpackers and defense personnel also can use them now drawbacks of uh, bed bathing is that we have to make use of plastic wash bowls now these plastic wash uh, washing bowls are also another source of infection and they lead to cross contamination and having a single use uh, plastic bar is a uh, plastic uh, uh, bowl is also a quite tedious and a uh, waste of resources now soap can also alter the ph of the skin <clears throat> as we all know that skin is slightly acidic and the uh, the soap that leads to the dryness and the skin breakdown and that suggests that the cleansing uh, the emollient uh, feature of the skin it should be used and made use of to keep the skin well lubricated now these should be prescribed for individuals uh individuals and pa and patients with you know a spoon or a spatula uh, should be used to descend or to put it apply it over the patients and contaminate contaminated part now new supplies should be uh, new uh, supplies should be prescribed following the treatment of the skin infection now what about reusable cloths wash cloths uh, we generally see in the icu that we are you know we keep reusing the cloths and we do not know how exactly they've been through or what kind of washing process and autoclave process that they've, they've been through but this also could be another source of cross contamination and increasing the chances of infection now therefore there is a need for a waterless body bath a composition that does not contain alcohol and paraben and cleanses the body completely without even leaving behind the undesirable residue and also has nourish, uh, nourishing the body and additional maintaining the ph similarly as we see body bath we also see shampoo because we've seen that the patients nowadays if they if it's a lady then she would have probably long hair if it's a male they would generally have you know beard or fa facial hair or mustache so we need to consider shampoos also as a specific uh, you know so uh, uh, liquid that we can concentrate and use over the facial hair or body hair now to maintain uh, to what we have seen is that it has similar effects like cleansing uh, action of the dirt dust and oil and also they would have antimicrobial antiseptic antifungal and some fragrance to it now similarly with the body bath we also have shampoos which could be wet and dry and they also have uh, sort of the same uh, contents some harmful surfactants alcohols and parabens that are being used in our wet shampoos so what about waterless shampoos and dry shampoos they are a great way to reduce the use of water as we have seen with body bath and since no water is required the dry shampoo can be used even for people uh, living in you know like the campers the defense personnel where the access to water is quite limited now what are the drawbacks of this dry shampoo they do not remove odor the dirt and sweat always seems to be left behind further unlike wet shampoos they leave behind harmful residues on their hair and hand therefore there is a need to you know there is a need to start something that is waterless but adequately cleans everything and does not have any of the uh, the toxic elements such as parabens harmful surfactants and uh, you know that also maintains the ph 
thus we have thus uh, we have our own product right now that is ducip that is free of alcohol paraben and harmful synthetic uh, surfactants that has been used currently in the icu now as we seen com uh, in comparison to the uh, uh, you know the alcohol that we were just talking about this relatively has the safer alcohol that we can apply over the skin and it has even gl uh, glycerol that has the anti freezing agent and the moisturizing effect to maintain the uh, suppleness and the emollient effect on the skin as well as uh, chlorhexidine number 6 if we see that the chlorhexidine is also there as an antiseptic uh, agent now we uh, the perfume fragrance and the other things are just accessorized but i feel the initial list is what is more important now this slide is quite important because we need to know how do we use it and how do we apply it so if we have a uh, the the ducip uh, bottle that is there that's around 100 ml and you can use in every use 15 to 20 ml of this body bath so you just take 15 to 20 ml and you apply it as a spray form on your body and you start massaging it for at least two to three minutes and all you have to do is just use a dry towel to wipe it off and that ensures you know that there is effective cleaning now with everything we need to understand what is the evidence behind it and how it has been tested so there is something called as a dirt depression test now that this dirt depression test is an experiment carried out which helped uh, you know which helped understand how much of the toxic material or how much of the waste could be uh, eliminated so after doing that test it indicated that the dirt dis dis uh, dispersion potency of the body bath products both with industrial as well as lab graded were good in comparison with that of the commercial grade product now cleansing activity the cleansing efficacy of do say water bath was measured physically as well as visual, visual examination now to do this they performed this test with ample amount of grease was applied and cleaned with the dry hands and of, of 9 to 10 uh, volunteers and this experiment was carried out also with other substances such as vehicle grease dirt mud lipstick and ink these are the common uh, sticky, sticky substances or you know the contaminated things that we would want to test overall the experiment suggested that the ducip water uh, waterless body bath significantly removed all types of stains from the skin and the other form of testing that they used now that was for the staining and more of the visual effect this was for the antimicrobial activity testing now for this what they did is that they used something called uh, called uh, they used uh, uh, the uh, agar plates which was seeded with uh, bacterial contaminant that was from the skin soil and dirty water now this was also compared with uh, the other things that in the industrial graded uh, industrial graded body bath as well as the body bath that was label grade lab graded and chlorhexidine now if we see in a b c petri dish the uh, antimicrobial inhibition area was almost at par and once they conducted the test the conclusion that they found that the investigated pro uh, the investigation products emerged as a non irritant sorry that was for the skin uh, irritation thing now for this the result was that it was also found that the extent of the inhibition zone depended upon the concentration of the body bath formulation and also on the underlying bacterial fixation as well now the other test that they use for finding nowadays is the cosmetic effect whether the patients are finding it quite irritating irritating on their skin or if it is being on their skin for quite a long time is there some kind of reaction that they are facing so to do this uh, the primary irritant patch test was done in which this product was applied for 24 hours and tested and test was performed and this was used in the age group of around 18 to 55 and the test was uh, over 9 days so after 9 days they went and they reviewed what was the uh, effect of uh, you know the ducive waterless body bath and they came to a conclusion that the investigational product emerged as a non-irritant product and uh, for 28, 48 hours and 7 days after the patch was removed, there was no adverse effect at all. So the advantages of all this was that it removes microbial, it removes dirt, it removes oil, it does not have any alcohol, paraben or any other uh, you know, toxic products and it provides an antimicrobial activity which is so important for all of us. Now it is also safe and quite gentle for the skin. Now, if we compare the waterless body bath compared with the sponge bathing, compared with the soap, compared with the body wash and the sanitizer, the body bath that we see is the, comp uh, the comprehensive cleansing completely removed the dirt as, well, as compared to the other ones where it partially did not. The, the second point is quite important right now. Water wastage, there was no water required at all. 
and the last one is the additional cost now the only thing that you need for that is the body bath and the towel that's all that is needed so the other thing that you uh, that is available right now apart from the body bath is the shampoo now for the shampoo uh, there is benzyl alcohol there is again you know uh, more uh, the anion uh, primary surfactant that is there that is quite important the skin conditioners are there now these things are quite important when you are considering the sebum that is left on the hair hair follicles so that is the one that needs to be cleansed also so now the way of application is quite similar you just need to take 15 to 20, uh, 20 ml of this dusty water shampoo and you need to gently massage it all over the hair and you need to leave it there for a couple of minutes and you just need to wash it off not wash it off i uh, i stand corrected is you, you just need a, a dry towel to clean it off now the efficacy tested uh, testing that was done was quite similar the dirt dispersion test was done then we also had the you know the irritant test that was done and every everything proved that you know this product was quite safe for uh, most of the usages now it also had the similar advantages where it removed microbes oils and uh, uh, microbes and dirty oil build up that was there uh, no alcohol paraben or the other harmful surfactant material that was used and uh it was quite effective in re removing most of the dirt and you know keeping the uh, patient's hair and uh, facial hair and everything quite uh you know quite fresh and the patient also they themselves gave a feedback that it is they felt quite you know self esteem then they felt quite fresh they felt quite uh you know liberated after doing this uh, after the cl cleaning session so both duce water uh, uh, the shampoo as well as the body bath have waterless effect technology and they are you they have been shown to be quite effective both scientifically also in practical use as well as in scientific use uh, now anyone can benefit from this waterless shampoo it is also of uh, to be of great benefit for hospitalized patients for icu patients and for those patients for those people who are you know going to areas where there the water supply could be less you know if you are going backpacking if you are going camping or if you are a defense personnel definitely these products can be carried on or carried uh, along with you so now these are some clinical evaluations and studies that are there and that would definitely support that uh, this product or this uh, you know the shampoo as well as the body bath is quite helpful so by and large if you see that uh, if you are using this day in and day out you would understand that with the new trend of environment friendly with the new trend of save water i think this product definitely seems to go in tandem with all of that and you would definitely feel yourself to be as you know a greater thunberg of your of your air or of your icu that you have done something for the environment apart from just saving lives and uh, you know avoiding the infections from setting in so with that yes. i'd like to conclude yes sir thank you thank you very much and only thing uh, one curiosity to everyone what is the cost the cost of the this cost yeah so you get two bottles yeah and uh, yeah so it is quite effective actually uh, initially we used to use a, a german brand which which i would not like to mention but right now we are using dusip which is quite effective and that just cost 370 rupees for a 100 ml bottle so you need the shampoo as well as the uh, other body body bath so once you use that you realize you are not messing up the area around the patient there is very less cross, cross contamination the sisters and the nurses find it quite easy for applying and for removing in fact so many times we have found that while doing this body bath while doing the shampoos we have also been able to address a lot of bed sores and the positions that were there for the patient so it is very important that your sister okay. or your caregiver is actually you know uh, quite aware and they are more at comfort for examining while they are while in the previous product where they used to give just the towels and just you know giving them uh, the okay. plastic bowls and everything it was quite tedious for them they used to spill over they used to contaminate the areas around but with yeah. this with this uh, dusip i have realized that it is quite convenient for both the patient as well as the caregiver okay yes sir so quite okay uh, i mean for the and is there any uh, one more uh, question was that is there any age limit i mean can you cannot use it below this age or you cannot use it after no, actually if you've seen the data that we have right now is that we've used it for uh patients from uh, for for the experimental thing we have used from 18 to 55 right so we have seen basically that this since it has chlorhexidine and since it has you know the emollients and everything it is quite safe for 
all the age groups age groups okay yeah so it would depend as to uh, for what purpose are you using it also are you using it inside the hospital are you using it outside the hospital so actually that does not make a difference also because if you're traveling if you're going backpacking somewhere or if you're going to an area where you know you know that there is not going to be a lot of water this product definitely seems to be helping a lot of people and it makes you feel fresh and it makes you you know uh, feel more clean that is what is important yeah that is the correct way of putting it i think and uh, can you just uh, elaborate on how many baths we can have in one bottle that is in the yeah so it it is a 100 ml bottle so you can use around 15 to 20 ml so i would say it would go around for a week at least okay okay that is a good use yeah Use. That was a very different topic, Doctor Sheikh. I mean, uh, and I think many people were very much enthusiastic for listening to your talk regarding this waterless bathing. And this is a new concept, a new revolution which will come in at least, especially in the uh, yeah, looking after the elderly persons and the persons who are bedridden. Correct. Uh, yeah, that it, it will be. A Boon for them actually if exactly. you get this into a proper market at a proper price. So, right, and, and the beauty uh, of it is that you know you can use it in your practical life so often. Like if supposing you're traveling somewhere, like I mentioned, or if you're you know nowadays people like to travel a lot, and I think that trend is going to happen where we need to save water a lot. Now with people getting involved into environmental saving and you know trying to save so much of plastic, you one use product, single use product. I think these products are definitely going to be of a lot of help. Hmm. even for operative patients it will be of help exactly exactly will have to remain bedridden without bath for till the stitches are there and the abdomen exactly exactly and the and it is such it is so easy to use that any lay person or any caregiver just one instruction you give or once you show them how it is done i think it just remains with them forever good thank you sir thank, thank you, you. Sir, now I request uh, our uh, president elect Dr. Minakshi Deshpande to felicitate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for an excellent job. This thank is you, a thank you very much. I am a super runner for you. Thank you. Thank and, you. Sir, thank you very much. And you really wish to Pune invite you to I am a Pune whenever it's possible for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. I would be delighted. Yes, everyone appreciated your topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I request uh, Alka Shir Sagar, madam, to give vote of thanks. First, first and foremost, I thank all our speakers. Today's speakers, Dr. Amit Dravid, Dr. Uh, Ashish Arbit, Dr. Pravin Patil, Dr. Dhananjay Chawan, uh, Dr. Uh, Mudassar Sheikh, and uh, Dr. Pra uh, one more, I think. so uh, it was a real excellent uh, feat for everyone uh, i thank all uh, our uh, delegates to because there were uh, almost uh, 350 delegates who attended today's even, uh, webinar even now there are 285 now, now also attending. there are 285 uh, delegates so it was a very uh, overwhelming uh, experience for all of us and i thank dr raju varyani he is a Uh, MMC, MMC observer. observer, so he is uh, physically present here in our IMA boardroom, and I thank uh, our IMA staff who uh, our, who helps us uh, in all this uh, activity. So thank you very much, and I say that uh, we will uh, conclude our uh, session. And thank you all for appreciating messages which are yeah. sent on the chat box. Yeah. So we really appreciate all the delegates also who are really listening. and who are uh, giving their uh, comments on the chat box so thank you we would like to conclude the session now today yeah thank you is that ha band karo na yes yes